we are on track for a soft landing. Even if storm clouds do materialize on the economic front, we think that's still a ways away. What it comes down to right now is the inflation picture. We feel quietly confident that by 2024, we're not going to be worrying about inflation. We should get to a point where we see a mild and shallow recession towards the end of the year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get your week started live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg <coughs> Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market slightly negative on the S&P 500. Going into earnings tomorrow from Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, on to Wednesday from Goldman Sachs. Tomorrow morning too, U.S. retail sales. Want to watch this morning, Secretary Yellen, the <coughs> Treasury Secretary, sitting down with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. TK, that interview in about two hours from now. Incredibly well-timed to speak the Secretary Treasurer here, not only off the Chinese report of some uh, some lessening of growth, I'll call it. We'll get to that in a, in a moment here. But it's a time where we have finance and investment dovetailing into each other. And that's a tension of this bull market that a lot of bears are trying to get used to. And election campaigns slowly building. A little bit of politics in there as well. Yeah. Starting to feel yeah. that Bramo a little bit more going deeper into July. Yeah, especially as we got over the weekend, some of the totals with respect to campaign finance for the Republicans. And it really showed a, a lack shock. of a I consolidation around yeah. any yeah. not Trump candidate, which is sort of interesting. Also, DeSantis really burning through his cash. But yes, to your point, <clears throat> it is getting crowded. It is heating up. How much oxygen do we have left for another candidate to come in on either side? Going into that first debate, in August. Let's talk about a market that's potentially getting crowded. Four day winning streak on the SP 500 last week snapped on Friday, but still a decent week of gains on the SP. A week of losses for the US dollar. Dollar weaker, TK. We're now looking potentially <clears throat> at eight days of yeah. euro strength against the US dollar. You've got to go all the way back to July 2020. For June 2020, now time right. for and, moves like and that. And I don't—I usually don't go to the euro, John, but I am, I'm going to agree with you today that you have to go to the euro as a litmus paper of the global system. This is the deepest market. It redounds back over to bonds, to an extent over to equities as well, touched by the earnings story. But at 112.41, when do we round that up to a shocking 113? The people that went long, strong euro 115, they're the geniuses of the moment. Well, Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank was looking for that move to 115, and he now says maybe that could even happen even faster. Let's check out yeah. the price action right now. Yeah. This Monday morning, futures just a little bit softer on the S&P. We're negative by 0.1%. Yields down again. Weak data out of China. We'll build on that. We're down six basis points. Your 10-year, 377.35. And there's the move in the euro that Tom's talking about, Lisa. 112.43 on the euro against the dollar. It has been one of the most consistent moves that we've seen over the past few weeks and how much oxygen it have left at a time when the dollar is creating this existential discussion in some corners. Today, the G20 20 finance ministers and central bank governors are meeting in uh, Gandhinagar in India. Uh, and this, to me, comes after that Chinese data that was so interesting. How do they dovetail growth versus uh, some sort of reining in of inflation? Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, as you were mentioning, John, will be speaking in an exclusive with our very own Anne-Marie Herdern at 8.15 a.m. this morning. What she says both about global growth as well as China will be key. 8.30 a.m., we get July Empire Manufacturing. How much do we see that continued upside surprise in the good data as well as downside surprises in the inflation data, the perfect mix that led to a lot of the enthusiasm last week. And today, the regional bank earnings kick off. And this comes ahead of Morgan Stanley and Bank of America tomorrow, Goldman Sachs on Wednesday. We get a slew of regional banks, FB Financial, Home Bank Corp, Cross First Bank Shares. You've never heard of any of them, but we are looking to see if the lending has slowed materially, what their cost of deposits really is, and the commercial real estate portfolios on their Balance sheet, John. There are many of those banks I've never heard of. <laughs> I, I admit. I could I could give you some more. Guaranteed bank shares. Sure. Southern California Bank Corp, Bank First Capital. They all report today. Okay. We're looking forward to that. Bramo, thank you. We caught up on Friday with Mohammed Al Arian. This is what he had to say. You cannot get in the way right now of the soft landing narrative. Let's talk to a house that is constructive on the equity market. Luke Cower, asset allocation strategist at UBS Asset Management, a good friend of ours. Luke Cower, good to see you this morning, buddy, as always. Luke, Thank why you are you here. still overweight equities over at the team at UBS? So I, I think you mentioned in the intro the idea that, you know, there, this is becoming a, a more subscribed idea and it is becoming, you know, possibly a more crowded position mm -hmm. in equities. Our, our view is really that the path to the soft landing has widened so much that it can accommodate uh, this crowd a, a little better. Just the, uh, you know, the, there's just more room for traffic, more lanes 
on this highway. It's it's very important to us that we've you know now seen a, a pretty marked deceleration in in core inflation in some of the more underlying super core inflationary metrics. You can say you know it's it's just one print, it's just the June CPI, but uh, in the eyes of investors, I think you have a lot of confidence that uh, you know we've slayed the inflation boogeyman and we've slayed the recession boogeyman at the same time and that's because you know they were very interlinked the inflation problem was a big drag on real incomes hurting real consumption and through the just uh, potential financial conditions channel uh, inflation was something that was causing central banks to be mm -hmm. on track to keep policy uh, tight for longer, but increasingly tighter for longer. And, you know, in our view, this is something this risk has, you know, receded somewhat. And, you know, that's very important. So we can move from a world in which in 2022 and part of 21, we were really relying on excess savings to to paper over the hit to real incomes. Uh, now it's real incomes that are right. going to allow for a measured but still very positive and decent growth in consumer spending going as, forward. As we waltz through Luke Kawa economics, we have to make choices in sectors. The key thing with the sectors is we broaden out the market. Does UBS see evidence that we are broadening out from the off-the-bottom October bull market condition? I, I would think certainly, and I would I would also add that even when the U.S. market uh, appeared narrow, that was still occurring in the context of uh, you know, European equity is still doing quite well. That was occurring in the context of, you know, Japan breaking out to a uh, fresh 30-year high. So even the narrowness of the U.S. market wasn't uh, necessarily speaking to a, a narrowness of, of the global equity rally. Uh, but in our view, what's, you know, what's changed and why we really want to uh, be, be selective about what we like. And what we like is the, the many in U.S. stocks, because that's where the resilience in the global economy is. And, you know, think about right now, I'm sure we might get to the disappointing Chinese data. On disappointing Chinese data, you know, you would normally think you'd have a much larger spread uh, between NASDAQ futures and, and uh, S&P 500 futures uh, than you have coming into today. And I think that's a testament to the expected earnings resilience of the many in the, in the U.S. equity market. And even as we have a higher bar to clear this earnings season, uh, it's a bar that looks actually you know, a lot more similar to a, a pre-pandemic environment than it does a inflation shock environment or coming out of the pandemic. There's a lot to unpack there, Luke. Just to follow up on what you were talking about, the data out of China over the weekend, are you saying that it's not going to be as impactful for a lot of the U.S. companies that are multinationals that do have big footprints in China? Or are you saying that that's already been discounted in the share prices? I would say I would say largely the former. Uh, the bad news about China is that you know, China's clearly lost a lot of uh, reopening momentum sequentially. That's very, very abundantly clear in the data that uh, you know more support will at some point be needed. Uh, the the good news from our point of view is that. Uh, this cycle, we haven't been nearly as reliant on the ebbs and flows of the of the Chinese credit impulse of Chinese policy for for global growth and global earnings as we have been in uh, you know let's say the the 15 years prior. So you know that development means I, I think you know you're seeing a lot of the classic uh, cross asset correlation still kick in this morning with uh, you know the the Antipodeans uh, with you know for instance uh, commodity still doing poorly. But how interesting is it, Lisa, that you have you know the dollar pretty much flat on a day with you know pretty disappointing Chinese growth data? I think that speaks to the idea that global growth can remain in a in a positive, uh, though you know not uh, not gangbusters and certainly decelerating state, even with China really not having its foot on the accelerator at all. It also might speak to the power of narrative, because this market seems to be driven by the narrative and the mood shift of the moment, and suddenly people are back in. Everything is awesome, and we are getting this soft landing kind of narrative. We are expecting a 9 percent drop in profits from S&P uh, companies as they report earnings over this quarter, over the next few weeks. A lot of people are saying that's priced in. What would it take for you to change your view, for you to say maybe there is more weakness under the hood than some people are considering? Well, first off, even on that 9% drop in profits, that's disguising a, you know, expected 1%, you know, small, but 1% advance year over year from the, the median company and S&P 500 earnings. I, I would think that, you know, one thing we've seen recently has been a, a, a pretty big recalibration in terms of how we've approached Earnings season, uh, in terms of estimates, really weren't cut that much uh, coming to the season relative to previous ones, uh, and pre-announcements were you know, generally more positive than they have been. I think if that guidance outlook took, takes a turn for the worse, uh, then that's something that you know we have to be cognizant of. 
because even if you have an expensive equity market and you know at the market cap level the S&P 500 certainly is at the equal weight or mid cap level we would you know argue that it's still actually relatively inexpensive but uh, if you're looking at you know 3 months 6 months 1 year performance the expensiveness of the equity market is not as important as whether earnings estimates are rising or not and you know for us that's going to be the key just to make sure that uh, this kind of nascent better trend we've seen of the you know bottom up reflecting our macro view of a widening path to the soft landing. If that were to come into question, then that's certainly something that would get us to, to reevaluate our position. So, Luke, let's just work through the base case right now. Strip out the muscle, the dominance of big tech from your portfolio, shift to equal weight, shift away from mega cap tech. Is that right? Where does Europe International fit into that backdrop? On the, on the Europe and international side, I, I think what we've had is you know, some capacity now for the, the Japanese story is, is obviously, you know, very strong. And we do enjoy the idea uh, that uh, Japanese equities are benefiting from some idiosyncratic catalysts in terms of the uh, massive kind of change in attitudes to the, the shareholder return programs there. You know, however, I, I would also say that, you know, European equities from the standpoint of having gotten um, you know, still still doing pretty well, but having you know surprises be be quite negative. Have the euro make quite a, a run. Um, if the euro continues to appreciate, obviously that's that's going to be a headwind to uh, to European equities. But you know, in in our view, the idea that the you know the U.S. dollar is going to weaken permanently on U.S. disinflation, uh, rather than the disinflation story becoming more widely spread, and U.S. still having that relative growth uh, resilience and probably a relative real rate advantage, uh, that's something that you know creates a, a bit more of a potentially range bound trade in the dollar offers a little more support and does take some of the uh, potential negatives out of the out of the way of the international equity sphere beyond that. Dollar, a touch weaker this morning. Luke, as always, buddy, it's good to see you. Luke out there of UBS Asset Management on the international story. Looking for this rally to broaden out over at UBS with Luke and the team. This is what we're seeing right now on the screen. Disappointment on the luxury players in Europe this morning. Richemont getting absolutely slammed in Swiss trading by about 9%. MS down by about 4, LVMH down 4% as well. We're off the highs of the year so far. TK, Richemont <clears> coming, <throat> in out, coming out with earnings a little bit earlier this morning, just a bit softer than expectations, but that really lit a fuse for this sell-off. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence does great, great work on this. I'm just voicing what they say, and we say luxury, but they partition that to be polite into three groups, if not five groups. And they've got the elite, the names we quote all the time, there's a middle pack, and then there's a sort of kind of like luxury as well. Their suggestion is with the Chinese worries, at the minimum, it affects the middle group and certainly the lower group. Jury's out on the, the super luxury Can you rank names. Richemont where the brands Cartier no, I, and Van Cleef fit I'm not into up your to speed on luxury. Richemont. I'm not. They're okay. Cartier. Cartier. Yeah, I, 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 Van I'm Cleef. just not Van Cleef. They you own found Van you, Cleef. found yourself in there a few times, I'm sure. Is that high-end luxury for you? It's, it's a high-end entrance. <laughs> the door at Van Cleef is so small, I almost have to duck to go into it. It's like something out of the 19th One century. One day you've got to do your review of the jewelry stores on Fifth Avenue. We should do we that. We do that yeah, another we time. Do that. Mislav <laughs> Matejka, JP Morgan this morning on China, for those of you interested. Take a listen to this. The region is sliding back into deflation. The property market will likely yep. need a much more aggressive policy, Tom, aggressive policy support to rebound sustainably. Yep. Given past excesses, we stay cautious on China. Others are more optimistic, but they both agree the key thing here for the United States is the price change metric in their slowdown. And you mentioned that in the first sentence with the wor worry of disinflation, if not outright goods inflate deflation in China. Next hour, Michael Schaul of Market Field Asset Management. A quiet start to the week. It picks up from tomorrow with U.S. retail sales in the morning. Tons of earnings, too. Lisa's gone through that for you on the regional bank inside. The bigger banks on Wall Street. They return tomorrow with the likes of Morgan Stanley and Bank of America. Then on to Wednesday with Goldman Sachs. Then next week, we start to talk about big tech all over again. Futures on the S&P, just a little softer. Good morning. The Fed, several times in the last several years, including when I was there, 
uh, got burned when they looked at data that was improving and extrapolated that. So I think this committee will certainly be wary of declaring mission accomplished uh, uh, and, uh, and victory. I think a softish landing uh, with some slowdown in growth and some modest rise in unemployment is what the Fed is aiming to achieve. The Powell Fed will keep at it, as they've said, until the job uh, is done. Always good to hear from Richard Clarida there, the PIMCO Global Economic Advisor and, of course, former Fed Vice Chair, mentioning that he thinks perhaps it's sensible to price in a rate cut in March of next year. TK, I'm sure you love that kind of commentary around the Federal Reserve, but ultimately that's what some people are looking for, maybe a reduction from the Federal Reserve. Bear in mind this week, no Fed speak. That's the good news for you. Into the quiet period, next week, a Federal Reserve decision. The Most Fed people decides. assuming they're going to hike interest rates, Tom. The unknown yeah. is beyond July, going through the summer and out into September and beyond. Guess what? They're ex post. They're going to wait for the data. The data matters. The retail sales matters. And then on we go. Annabelle Ike, let's remember it's July 17, I believe, is the date today. So we're dashing, say, two weeks away, two long weeks away from a jobs report from ISM in August. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to wait for more data. Tons of earnings in between as well. Uh, yeah. And the earnings are not a small matter. I believe Apple, August 3rd. Get that know, one in we'll their diary have to or the see. journal. Or the calendar. We're going to digress right. Huh? We're <laughs> going to digress calendar. right calendar. now. It's on the calendar. <laughs> yeah, it's on the calendar. You know. Or in your diary. I think I'm taking all of August off. Uh, joining us now is a gentleman who knows what a town meeting is in New Hampshire. Long ago and far away, Grandpa Vellier took the grandson off in the L.L. Bean boots and, you know, the plaid shirt and all that. They went by canoe in New Hampshire to the local town meeting. Nobody going by canoe today, this middle of July to see Mansion of West Virginia and Greg Villiers at New Hampshire. Mr. Villiers joins us now. Chief U.S. Policy Strategist at AGF. He's never recovered from that rock up by Bretton Woods falling off the cliff. <laughs> Greg, you know New Hampshire like anyone we speak to. What is the symbolism of the gentleman from West Virginia in the Granite State? Well, it's fascinating. And by the way, Tom, when I was a little kid, my dad took me to see John Kennedy. I shook John Kennedy's hand. That was wow. quite an event. But, Very cool. but a, a lot of politicians make their bones in New Hampshire, and Joe Manchin is aware of that. So the big political story, and there have been many, the DeSantis collapse, uh, the, Jay, the Robert Kennedy gaffe. But the big story today clearly is going to be Joe Manchin, the maverick from West <clears throat> Virginia, going to New Hampshire for this group, uh, no labels, uh, indicating, I think, teasing a possible presidential run. Inform our audience, particularly our international audience, what form of maverick is he? I understand that Professor Carter yeah. of, I believe, Harvard is to the left of Bernie Sanders. Where does Manchin sit right left of the president of the United States? Clearly in the center. I think he feels that uh, the Biden administration has spent too much money has been uh, reckless on a lot of domestic policies. So he's he's a centrist. He, th he feels there's a, a, a road there, a path, and there may be a path. I'm not sure he's going to be the nominee, but he could stir things up and weaken up Biden for the general election. Well, that was what I was going to ask, Greg. Who would he weaken more, Joe Biden or whoever is going to win the ticket on the Republican side? Well, I, I think if, if – I'd say Joe Biden. I'd say if Manchin gets 20 or – 25 percent, and I don't think I don't think Robert Kennedy is going to get much after this weekend. Then I think that could hurt Biden a little bit. Uh, but at the same time, if he really campaigns as a centrist, uh, as a third-party centrist, he could do well. Not well enough to win, but certainly well enough again to hurt Joe Biden. There seems to be in the zeitgeist this morning a discussion about uh, Ron DeSantis and whether his campaign is doomed, especially given how quickly he's been burning through cash and his lack of yeah. investments, lack of contributions from smaller uh, uh, contributors. Do you agree with that? Do you think that there is a path for some sort of resurrection and getting back his momentum? I think he is going to campaign in all 99 counties in Iowa. Uh, I think he has to take Iowa much more seriously. Uh, he has uh, indicated he didn't want to join the debate. No, he has to join the debate. But I, I think that uh, right now the lead is about 40 
points around the country uh, for Trump over DeSantis. That's a really big lead. Meanwhile, uh, another news uh, item that really caught our attention over the weekend was UPS and some of these strikes uh, that have been ongoing with the workers. They haven't yet declared strike, but they are heading to that deadline and are looking likely to reach that level. There are a slew of other strikes. UPS, uh, the workers have asked Joe Biden's administration not to intervene the way that they did in the rail strikes. From your perspective, why is it that we're seeing such a slew of strikes and union uh, activism over the past couple of months? And what are the implications for the U.S. economy? Well, to me, it's the sleeper of the, of the late summer, Lisa. First of all, a lot of workers feel that their salaries are not keeping pace with prices of, of housing and food and gasoline, things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's a, an economic argument for it. But, you know, it's not just Hollywood. It's a UPS. It's the United Auto Workers who are making noise. They could go on strike. And it, it is Southern California, uh, housekeepers at hotels. And the, the Hollywood strike has had a ripple effect on Southern California. So I think this is going right. to be a real sleeper to see if Joe Biden gets actively involved. Yeah, Greg Valle, my shock of the weekend, and whatever anybody thinks of his politics, pro-con, I really don't care about the political debate. But the fact is, the public service of the former vice president of the United States, Mr. Pence of Indiana, is noted. I was stunned at his inability to raise money. Were you yep. surprised? Absolutely. It was a really weak number. There, there aren't any many candidates who can say, I, I did great. Maybe Tim Scott of South Carolina. But the performance by Pence, you're right, Tom, was a real surprise. Let's finish on that, Greg. Next month, there is a debate on the stage may or may not be the former president, Donald Trump. The former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie, put out an ad over the last week, basically calling the former president a chicken for not turning up. Now, Greg, yep. from your perspective, do you believe that the former president will be on that debate stage come August? Knowing his love of publicity, I would say yes, John. I think, I think he couldn't resist uh, getting involved in this. So uh, he'll be persuaded to join the debate, in my opinion. Greg Valliere of AGF. Investments. Greg, thank you. <clears throat> Just a month away, TK. Next month, Fox uh, News, I too believe. soon. Hosting that, a uh, big Republican field. I just yearn for, well, Wimbledon's over, so let us move on to the six day battle for the election in the United Kingdom. I just, it's ridiculous. But with that said, all of a sudden this weekend it became more interesting when uh, there's some real challenges there about fundraising and signatures and the rest. I can't say I really read in it over the weekend. We rely on a guy like Vallier to do that. But uh, there were some surprises this weekend politically, no question about it. You can it. see arguments for and against the idea that the former president and attends that if you're on his team. Can't you, Bramo? You can see reason why he wouldn't. Just let them fight between themselves. He's got a decent lead in the polls right now. <laughs> so here's his response to it, exactly, on uh, a Sunday morning futures on Fox News over the weekend. He said, so you're leading people by 50 and 60 points, and you say, why would you be doing a debate? It's actually not fair. Why would you let somebody that's at zero or at one or two or three be popping you with questions? So that's his response sure. to uh, the chicken comments from Chris Christie and just in general why he may not show up. Why should he give them a platform? Form, I guess is his perspective, right? At the same time, it is incredible publicity, and his absence could be construed as differently than perhaps he would like. So this is the key question, especially if Chris Christie is going to have such a taunt. And that's basically what he's being paid for. That's basically oh, what he's getting raised. He's raising time. money. That's like to, his role. His role is to put out this stuff, basically mocking the former president. Somebody came up to me this weekend and said, who is Mohammed El Arian? You know, they, weren't, they weren't disparaging of Dr. El Arian, but they said just, you know, it's like Butch Cassidy. Who is this guy? And he wrote an essay, John, here in the last 24 hours for Bloomberg, which completely encapsulates El Arian. It's about game theory and how we play in the time continuum. And this is just absolutely brilliant of the moment. Right now, we're playing in the equity markets of what hasn't happened. That's a really, really important insight. I had the pleasure of talking about some of this with him on Friday, Tom. Do you want to tell us where you were when that person came up to you? On Friday, where was I? Some McDonald's. Yeah. Sure. OK. Yeah. First Kelsey Barrow, J.P. Morgan, up next.
Monday morning, good morning. Equities just a little softer, negative, lighter, lower down on the S&P 500. Futures off by 0.1%, <coughs> snapping a four-day winning streak last week on Friday with a muted move lower. Really mild stuff on the Nasdaq too. We're negative by 0.03%. Weak data out of China overnight. Cuts, cuts, cuts to the forecast for Chinese growth. Look at this. City cut. Morgan Stanley, cut. JP Morgan, cut. Sockgen, cut to 5% from 55 And has this for a quote. <clears throat> this can only be achievable if the government continues to step up easing measures. So 5%, yeah. Tom, it's 5%. And apparently, according to Sockgen, it needs some stimulus. It's going to be some really interesting discussions here. And you really can't watch Renminbi as the, as the litmus paper. You have to watch the policy prescriptions out of Beijing, something that maybe Anne-Marie will discuss with Secretary of Treasury Yellen here. I thought that Pantheon had a terrific short note. Duncan Wrigley over there is really adding a lot of value. And he said, you know what, this is really not that good, except China's not crashing. And there's some real parallels here to where, oh, OMG, America's falling apart. Well, maybe we weren't. <laughs> and his, his, there was a tinge of Shepherdson gloom in the Pantheon note, but Wrigley said, let's be clear, this is not the end of the world as we know it. I agree, but it's all relative to expectations, Tom, from earlier yes, this year. Yes, yes. And earlier this year, we're looking forward to the world's second largest economy reopening, potentially booming, and here we are sitting in the middle not of 2023. We're not booming. No, no, we're yeah, not booming. We're not booming. And we're talking about government support. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year treasuries, take a look right now. Last week, two-year, down almost 20 basis points. 10-year, down around about 20 basis points. Real move lower TK off the back of softer inflation data point after softer yeah. inflation data point through last week. I looked at that moments ago here on the break. John and Lisa were talking Mission Impossible, and I was talking, OK, where's the bond market? And the bond market on a blended basis here, yes, it's price up, yield down, but it hasn't broken out to new, the, to new terrain. Well, soft landing was Mission Impossible six months ago, TK. And now everyone's nice. starting to coalesce <laughs> around that view. That's what I'm here for, Bramo. Just to wind over amazing. the wrinkles. Oh, yeah. right. well, that was, that was pretty that's good. That's all I'm here for. And with that view, a bit of dollar weakness out there at the moment. Let's push it through foreign exchange. The euro stronger against the US dollar for an eighth consecutive session. Close here right now. This would be the longest such streak going yeah. back to June 2020. Tom, it's been a while. This is, of everything on the screen this morning, this is the constraint, if you will, mathematically, is euro buttressed up against new uh, European strength. Let's push it out and talk about the Federal Reserve for July and beyond. The former Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarida saying market bets for a rate cut in March make sense. JP Morgan's Kelsey Barrow writing this, rate cuts will need to be preceded by a more material weakening in the labour market. Tom, while we are seeing softening under the surface, we will need to see a further slowing in job creation or a sharp pickup in layoffs to cause the Fed to shift away from the concept of <clears throat> higher for longer. Joining us now, Kelsey Barrow, fixed income portfolio manager that barely describes her duties with Mr. Michael over JP Morgan Asset uh, Management. Boy, am I glad you're here. First of all, have you people changed tone, duration, stability? The Fabozzi curve, out, 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 rather, Fabozzi out the yield curve, all the different metrics you use, have you changed that view given the news flow of the last 10 days? So I think the biggest data point that is impacting our view has been the recent inflation data. Uh, I think what we've seen there is increased confidence that inflation is coming yep. down. And it's coming down faster than the Fed projects. The Fed has a forecast of 3.9% for core PCE by the end of the year. We think they're going to get there, and we're going and they're going to go even further. Inflation is going to move down even further. Uh, so for us, what we're seeing is the Fed is going to be able to pause, and it's going to be a function of this inflation data coming down uh, faster than the Fed projects. I, I look at this and I say, okay, what's the tactical response? Like, do you barbell? Do you ladder? Do you shift your ladder out, picking up greater duration? What's the do right now? So we've been looking at the fixed income market this question? year. It was just a great trying to, trying to impress you. Bob's watching, so I just want to <laughs> A great question. And I think all morning I've been hearing you guys debate soft landing or hard landing, right? And what does that mean for fixed income? Well, the good news is, is that regardless of a soft landing or a hard landing, if the Fed is at the end of the cycle, bonds are going to outperform. So you look at the last seven rate hiking cycles, including the ones which were soft landings. That's 1984. 
1995. In all of those scenarios over the next two years, cumulatively, bonds outperformed cash or three-month T-bills by an average rate of 13%. So we can disagree about if it's going to be a hard landing or a soft landing, but what we can agree upon is getting an allocation to core fixed income at this time is the appropriate positioning for an end of cycle uh, time for the Fed to pause. Matt Hornback, Morgan Stanley agrees with you, says Barney dips in bonds. Can we talk about the potential limits of a, ran- of a rally? Some people think maybe yields won't fall that far that quick. I know that you and the team are looking potentially for 3% across the whole curve. Can you help people who are listening to this right now make sense of that? So right now the two years at 472 and you think there's potential to get down to 3.0. The 10 years at 377, the 30 years at about 390. Can you just walk us through how you're thinking about that? Yeah, to us, what we're seeing is not that there are limits to the rally. There's actually limits to the sell-off. So if you look at the 10-year yield so far year to date, it's not been able to sustainably trade above 4%. So if you look back, we had a peak at four and a quarter in Q4 of last year. We tried to retest that 4% level in Q1 of this year. It failed. We then tried to retest 4% again in Q2. That also failed. So what we're seeing is that there are limits to how high longer dated yield yields can trade. And to us, that's a signal that we are later in the cycle. The Fed does have limits to how far they can go. Um, and, and that is reflecting in this very historic yield curve inversion that we currently see. So later cycle, considering end of cycle, buy core fixed income, treasuries rally got that. Why are high yield spreads near the tights of the year? Yeah, so it has been a grind tighter for credit uh, in general. And so we've been looking with our high yield analyst about what is going on. And there are certainly a lot of cross currents. So if you look across the sectors, right, you're hearing different things across every sector. Every sector is kind of operating in its own little cycle. You hear from the chemicals or technology and high yield, not so great, right? Then you hear from leisure and hospitality and people can't stop traveling. Everyone on my Instagram is in Europe this summer. I mean, it's incredible. That's funny, mine too. There you go. Yeah. Um, and so it, what we're seeing ultimately, though, is that in the absence of a material weakening in the labor market, you're seeing that people just want to get that spread and they just want to get that yield. And on top of that, we've had very little issuance in the high yield market. So the technicals are really there for that grind tighter. And what we found historically is that high yield spreads really don't blow out until the recession is actually here. So this this move <coughs> is not really that unusual, but it really has been a grind. Do you still see a recession, though? I mean, is it incompatible to see the strength that we're seeing that's underpinning this euphoria that we felt last week and the tighter spreads, as John was mentioning? Is that compatible with a steady grind lower in inflation? So we do see a recession still in the horizon. Uh, We have seen strong labor markets, but it's really important to understand that the labor market is a lagging indicator. So the unemployment rate bottoms right as the recession starts, and the unemployment rate doesn't peak until a recession is ending. So what we're looking at is the leading indicators, uh, things like uh, gross domestic income, which is softening below the surface, hours worked within the, the labor report, which is also softening. And we're saying the five 500 basis points of rate hikes that have already occurred, they're not behind us. They're still impacting the economy. Well, but to John's point, we're seeing spreads right now in high yield bonds at the tightest levels going back to April of 2022. This has been an incredible grind. If credit is a leading indicator, it is saying that we're not going to get a recession, we're not going to get a default cycle, and all systems go when you look at stocks and where they are. So from your vantage point, do you reset and start to allocate a little bit more to riskier sectors than, say, a couple of months ago, when a lot of people, J.P. Morgan included, saw a more imminent recession on the horizon. So where I would disagree is credit being a leading indicator. In fact, credit, uh, high yield spreads don't actually tend to blow out until the recession is actually upon us. So just because risk assets are doing well now doesn't mean that a recession isn't on the horizon. So for us, Mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're uh, focusing on a high quality fixed income portfolio. So that's investment grade over Mm -hmm. high yield. Another sector we really like right now, agency mortgage backed securities, you can get very attractive valuations there. You get a lot of the spread without a lot of the risk. Kelsey, most people in the equity space think the bond market's three guys in a room with a slide rule. And the fact the opposite is true. It's much bigger, much deeper, et cetera. But at the margin, bonds can move off equity valuations. Are bonds competing now with equities? Are people buying particularly credit 
corporate quality bonds versus owning equities now. Do you observe that? Yeah, we absolutely do observe that. Um, so what we're seeing is that people are taking this opportunity to uh, pick up the yields that are historically attractive. So if you look back, real yields, for an example, are at their highest level in 15 yeah. or 20 years. Uh, and this is not an opportunity that comes around very often, uh, particularly in an era where the Fed has had to go to the zero lower bound multiple times in the right. last few decades. What are you guys going to say on issuance? I mean, I mean, I know you take the call, but Bob Michael, they, they, what they do, folks, is when they issue bonds here, some big fancy company, they call four people and one of them's Bob Michael. He's out at lunch watching Liverpool, so you get the phone call. Are you getting phone calls about bond issuance right now? We are. Uh, so it, there is a little bit of a bifurcation between the markets. So as I mentioned, high yield uh, has been a, a market that has not had very much issuance. On the other hand, you have investment grade market it's it's fully open um and, and there there is issuance taking place kelsey love it as always kelsey barrow there of jp morgan asset management with some calls to some of you which might sound somewhat controversial because tom we're still pretty divided around the bond market right now oh, huge huge pretty it's, divided it's a, around the technically outlook it's the a Fed perfect too. pennant it's a per, it's a pennant i'm not going to go into it right now it's too much chartiness on a monday but we're still waiting evidence of what which way bonds will cut i loved your idea of of, of the effect of european gdp they shut down the acropolis uh, this morning the in the the economic impact of americans over, let's say, just like a, it's like Gilligan's Island. It's like a three island tour off Italy. Is this a travel it's segment been, now? It's been profound. Every segment. It's been profound to see. Have you not realized? Quote this? of the week last week. <laughs> yeah. Quote of the week last week for me didn't come from Wall Street, came from Ed Bastian at Delta, speaking to Bloomberg that flying is the number one priority for discretionary spending. There is significant growth ahead. You listen to the bank CEOs on a consumer, things are still okay. I stress okay. I don't think they were overly enthusiastic about the outlook, but ultimately, Tom, things still OK. And the likes of Ed Bastian and Delta saying significant growth yet ahead. It's a really odd cycle where you've got people in the bond market odd talking cycle. about yeah. end of cycle dynamics by treasuries. And you've got an airline CEO saying, let's go. Let's go and let's hike up fares. It is a post-pandemic. Yeah. I'm expecting <laughs> that. that. I'm yeah. kind of Melissa, to jump in here. I think it's really important. It's a post-pandemic original cycle, and I think odd cycle captures it. I you take know. that point. We can't really factor in the change in behavior and how much have people changed their behavior after being locked up for however long, depending on the region that they're in. The FOMO, the feeling of you need to live, you need to get out there, has not gone away, and it is a relic of the pandemic. And how long? that last? Is this a sea change? I will just say to your comment, John, about how divided things are. Liz Young uh, said in, in, a, in a story that was published on Dow Jones, it's almost resembling a political landscape where each side looks at each other with anger and resentment, resentment, unable to find common ground. The recessionistas plus the bulls. And that seems to be where we are. Oh, without a doubt. But last week was a bit of a game changer for some people. Absolutely. Even for Mohammed al Erin, who's been quite outspoken about what this Fed should and shouldn't do, He's pushed back against this doom gloom around the economy that maybe we can avoid a recession, depending, of course, on what the Federal Reserve is going to do. I just think last week, even if you believe that we won't get a soft landing, Mohammed's point on Friday was that the current narrative is so hard to fight that maybe you don't want to fight it in the market just yet, Tom. Off the back well, of the data last week. There's short covering, and then what? In the end, then what, with Lisa's leadership over the next five, ten days, is going to be this earnings season. And frankly, what I've seen so far, starting with Ed Bastian and moving forward to the terrible earnings from J.P. Morgan, God, I was I was absolutely crushed at the number of billions of dollars. And Kelsey's ready yeah, to jump exactly. back in. <laughs> She's here. looking angry. <laughs> you know, God, I, you know, I, I don't know. You know, it, it was it was just terrible, terrible numbers. Beating I just, a raise you know, from J.P. Morgan, I think, a beat and a raise from Wells Fargo. City kind of getting it done, and it's on to Bank of America and you know, Morgan Stanley Kelsey's tomorrow. Got, Kelsey's got her own table over at Lever House. I mean, she just, you know, she goes over lunches and, you know, and hosts bond market whilst Bob lunch. is watching a football. The little curvy cube mm. bar there with the TV Bob's, with Bob's going to love you for that. It. Sure. It's like a Lever House thing. Equities right now on the SP, negative 0.1%. Kelsey, thank you. From New York City, good morning. When Chinese growth slows, it has an impact on growth in many countries, and we are, we are seeing that. So it is something I discussed with 
uh, Chinese counterparts uh, discussed what plans they have to take actions to um, address the weakness in their economy. One hour, 30 minutes away, Janet Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, sitting down with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Just moments ago, speaking from India on the global economy and on the outlook for Chinese growth. Really looking forward to this conversation. Just a few weeks after Janet Yellen sat down with government officials in China. The latest data in China this morning getting tons of attention. Citigroup lowering its forecast for the country. Morgan Stanley doing the same thing together with JP Morgan. Sokjen as well. Other banks out there as well. Now looking for 5% GDP growth from China, which is around the government's target for 2023. But most people stressing that to achieve that, it is going to need further government support. Off the back of those numbers. Equity is just a little bit softer on the S&P 500. We are negative by 0.1%. No real drama here. Another leg down, leg lower in yields in the bond market. We're down six basis points on a 10-year, 377. And it's just a grind, a brutal grind for anyone long the US dollar against the euro at the moment. 112.34. We're grinding out another day of gains potentially for the euro, Tom, against the dollar. This is day eight. <coughs> It's day eight of, of, of the euro up, but more than anything to me, John, it's just a follow on to what will the data be, the economic data today. Like you say, we're heading towards quiet period for the Fed, but also this earnings announcement. And I take it globally. I would say that U.S. earnings have a ramification on the correlations of the global market as well. Given the outperformance of tech so far this year, Tom, you'd have to believe that next week is the start of the real earnings season for many people. If you've taken on some of these tech positions, Microsoft reporting, you get Alphabet, you get Meta. Then on to the week after that, you mentioned early August, August 3rd, right? For yeah. Apple, Tim Cook. Yeah. Then it's on to Apple in early August. And well, we'll just have to see based on what, what we've seen so far, which is very little at what I'm calling call disappointment after the measured pull down we've seen over the last 10 weeks. My book of the summer is Olivier Blanchard. It's a wonderful treatise on our start and all the different monetary mumbo jumbo out there. Without question, the book of the year on China is by a professor at the London School of Economics. This one has crept up uh, on the zeitgeist, a new China playbook uh, beyond, a capital, beyond socialism and capitalism. Kaiyu Jin, who's been a, a good supporter of this effort, Bloomberg Surveillance, we're thrilled that Professor Kaiyu Jin could join us this morning. First of all, congratulations on the impact of the book. What is beyond socialism and capitalism for China? Well, I think these labels no longer are that relevant to describing today's world. China sees a mix of its own socialism and, of course, markets work very well. And it uh, has a new playbook, uh, more about the softer metrics of development and, of course, dealing with the new geopolitical tensions. It has to have a new playbook in that sense. One of the research notes I saw today hearkened very much to the U.S. recovery of consumers in China spending a lot on this, that and the other thing, tourism and that. But separate from that, the goods and I'll call uh, state-owned enterprise economy really, really struggling. What is the goal yeah. of Beijing? What is the goal of a totalitarian regime to drive those two together to prosperity? I don't see that plan. Well, Team China doesn't work as effectively as it did in 2009 after the Great Recession. You can call in state banks and they will be, you know, flush with liquidity and then the state will undertake large projects, infrastructure projects. And that's, that's what got China back on track. That's not going to happen now. Uh, there's uh, the returns to st the effective stimulus is lower now. And there's actually really no appetite for a massive stimulus in China. The bottom line is the Chinese government is going to do enough so that China securely and safely progresses its economy towards 23,000 per capita dollar uh, income uh, in the next 10 or so years, but probably no appetite for much more than that. At this point, though, Kayo, there's a huge question, especially around the employment picture in China, with a record amount of youth unemployment, 16 to 25, really uh, challenging some of the sentiment. How does that play into whatever stimulus the uh, uh, Politburo decides to agree upon, perhaps even as soon as in the next couple of weeks? Well, for sure, the youth is the the key group and audience that the government will prioritize. But it's not like there are no jobs around. There's 25 million 
job gap in manufacturing by 2025. And just like sectors like semiconductors, there's a 300,000 talent gap every year. The problem is that the Chinese, in the Chinese economy, education raced ahead. And there's a big skill and education mismatch. So now the government is trying to expand vocational schools and try to lure more students into doing less bachelor's degrees and more vocational training. China aspires to be a giant, smart uh, Germany uh, with industrial and technical power. So we're, we're going to see that play out. But really in the short run, we're talking about an economy trying to wean off of property, which accounted for 30 percent or more of GDP. That's why we're seeing, this is the primordial reason why we're seeing such a <coughs> slowdown or uh, a lack of recovery in China. Do you take issue, Kaya, with some people who say that part of the problem is that multinational companies have been increasingly moving out of China and trying to de-risk some of the political cross currents by shifting to Vietnam, shifting to India, where Janet Yellen currently is speaking and has visited three times in the past nine months? Well, Vietnam is about a size of, um, you know, a, a, a province, uh, maybe even smaller. So I just don't think all the, the, the world's factory can be realistically shifted out into Southeast Asia. And anyways, China's trying to move the global uh, up the you know value of the global value chain. So it's consistent with its economic uh, development. Um, but I think all in all, it's deeply embedded in the global supply chain system, which is also why, you know, zero inflation right now is also meaning it also means that's not going to add to inflationary pressure uh, globally. I, I, I look uh, at where we are with Orville Shell, say, writing about, you know, the challenges that Xi faces in China uh, faces as well. What is the economic sophistication and knowledge of Beijing to address these domestic issues. There's a feeling, and I, I, the great work of Foreign Affairs magazine and the CFR, I'm, I'm going to mention off of this, there's just a feeling that these guys aren't that sophisticated, that they're working within a communist structure, which is in your book, that's dated. Do they have sophisticates advising them to make constructive solutions? I think the policymakers are incredibly sophisticated and there are experts around. The question is, what is the central leadership priority right now? And it's not just about economic efficiency anymore, economic growth. That was the old playbook. Today, it's about security. It's about realizing the Chinese dream. Uh, again, that goes to Chinese socialism. So it's not just about economic efficiency. But on the government policy, I think there's a really incredible amount of um, you know, thinking behind that. And there's still policy scope. Take the local government debt issue. Yes, a huge amount of debt, especially the shadow banking sector. But they're coming up with a plan, lots of different ways, for instance, uh, commercial banks absorbing part of the debt, setting up new funds at the local government level to inject liquidity. It's, it's more of a choice rather than a lack of expertise, I'd say. Okay, thanks for joining us today. Always a pleasure listening to you. Thank you. Kei there of the London School of Economics and author of the new... China Playbook, that conversation following the latest data out of China. Slightly disappointing. We've had a string of worse than expected economic data through China, not just over the last couple of weeks, but I'd say really over the last six months. There's been great disappointment about what hasn't materialised in that economy, TK, relative, of course, to pretty lofty expectations off the back of reopening. We are so wedded to three cities in the Pacific Rim, and there's this whole China West, including the record heat recorded 126 degrees Fahrenheit just over the weekend. And the answer is, in the broad spectrum of China, there's only one, you know, talk dual mandate, triple mandate, there's only one mandate, employ people. And Lisa, you nailed it with that question on the youth at 21 percent unemployment. There's also a question about some of the ramifications on the tariffs from the U.S. and what would have been with respect to the intricacy of the interlocking of companies, of multinational companies. And Brad Setzer, who used to work at the Treasury Department, put out a string of threads, uh, a thread of, of tweets over the weekend saying that trade has gone down. Imports to the U.S. would have been so much higher from China if it hadn't been for those tariffs. That is the suggestion from some of the data. So you do wonder around the margins how much some of the geopolitical landscape is also affecting what we're seeing on the ground in China. So not a thread of threads on threads. I, you know, I, I but yes, a string of tweets on Twitter, <laughs> which is called a thread. I'm I'm struggling it's with so this. Difficult, yeah, it's so isn't difficult. It? I, Thank I, you. I don't for get it. How, how's threads out? going? You know. It's a little slow. No, Friday, there was a yeah. no, no. Friday, there was a blistering note that a lot of people are quitting. I'm in the vanguard are of they? that. 
I know. Uh, it's just not working. Well, I, uh, you know, it's harder me. to find people. It's harder to cultivate your tweet string, your thread needle. It shows the strength of Twitter <laughs> if Musk would fix it. I, my Twitter feed That's is dramatically weaker than it was. The boom bust cycle of threads. This lasted, what, two weeks? Yeah. This conversation has <laughs> turned so quickly. Yes. It's like the Red Sox. Let's see how this goes. Equities right now, a little softer. From New York, this is Bloomberg. We are on track for a soft landing. Even if storm clouds do materialize on the economic front, we think that's still a ways away. What it comes down to right now is the inflation picture. We feel quietly confident that by 2024, we're not going to be worrying about inflation. We should get to a point where we see a mild and shallow recession towards the end of the year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. We've just had a week of quiet confidence following the economic data in America. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Getting your Monday morning started with equity futures slightly negative on the S&P 500, down by 0.1%. One hour, 15 minutes away. Secretary Yellen catching up with Bloomberg's Amory, AMH and Secretary Yellen, TK, looking forward to this one, particularly after this visit from the U.S. Treasury Secretary to China. In the travels of uh, Secretary Yellen, not only there, but to Europe uh, as well, this is an international Secretary of Treasury that has to come home to some serious uh, domestic issues. One idea, I don't know if Amory will get to it, there's so much other news, is the zeitgeist over the weekend of the ample amount of debt in America, which leads us to a linkage with Japan and Italy for amount of debt out there. Looking forward to that point, that view, her view on that pot topic, Tom, but also on the data out of China overnight. We've talked about a range of banks that have come out, just a whole host of them yeah. following that economic data. Cut, cut, cut across the board. Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Salt Gen, take your pick. Out there at the moment, Lisa, cutting their expectations for growth in China this year. What does that mean for Europe? What does that mean for the luxury sector? We saw a sense of that from Rich Ma this morning and all of the others joining it uh, in some sort of decline with concern around China sales. But on a larger level, how much has the recovery so far, albeit not as strong as a lot of people thought, how much has that fueled some of the wagers overseas that perhaps might be losing some steam? This is some of the questions that people have this morning. Germany, recession. Yeah. There are these hopes out there, aren't there, that this rally is going to broaden out. We've got the perfect guest to have this conversation with in just a moment. One stock I want to look at, just briefly, Paramount in the pre-market, mm. negative 2.9% box office numbers for Mission Impossible. <laughs> Slightly disappointing. Tom, I'll give you my review, if you want it, I in would about like your 28 minutes away. Well, well give, give us the review right now. I mean, the guy does his own stunts. Uh, Grace is lovely. I mean, the plot is deeply thick. But am I right? It's a prequel to the real movie? It's timely. It's about artificial intelligence as well. I enjoyed the beginning of it, but it felt like a warm-up for part two. And I don't want my movies to feel like a warm-up for part two. I want them to be somewhat conclusive, you know? That's what it felt like, Tom. It did feel like that in the theatre on Saturday. It felt like you were sitting around for something that comes out in... Nine months. Can I just say, you're like, I'll give you my review in about well, then he asked minutes for it. time. Then he asked Tom's for like, it. I can't I mean, wait, I can't wait. Michael no, Scholl. That's, that's, that's the tease. The full <laughs> review comes in 27 <laughs> oh, minutes. Michael <okay>. Scholl <laughs> is deciding, should he go see it with the Rugrats? And, you know, the answer is it's, you know, maybe I can see Michael Scholl at a Barbie movie. It's still a solid no, movie. Maybe. Michael could go to the Barbie movie. Yeah, you know. Oppenheimer yeah, too. It's summer movies. <laughs> it's good to see the theatre business doing what it's doing. Relative to where we were three I mean, years ago when yeah. we thought it was dead and we'd never go to the movie theater again. Yeah. But it's, you know, they're going to the IMF. I didn't know that, that in the movie he's part of the IMF, that he's working for Gorgieva. I didn't know that. Yeah. Is that news yeah, to you? That's news yeah, to me. Ethan is, is deputy Ethan's director of the is IMF. Yeah. IMF, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Equities right now, softer by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Slightly negative. Yields are lower by five basis points. That run resumes. We're down to about 378 on a 10-year. And this run continues. The euro against the dollar. Just about on the screen right now, squeezing out 
an eighth day of strength against the US dollar. And I say just, we're positive 0.03%. That currency pair right now, Lisa, 112.31. It's, it's been an amazing move over the past uh, couple of weeks. Today, you did mention that we are going to be hearing from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who will be in a conversation with her own Anne-Marie at 8.15 a.m. Eastern. That comes as she is. Uh, Janet Yellen is in Gandhinagar, India, today and tomorrow. Also yesterday, as she does attend this G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting, very curious to hear about the balance between inflation concerns and growth at a time when the U.S. economy is possibly going to fuel uh, the global economy much more than it has in the past just because of China and that data we were just talking about. 8.30 a.m., July Empire Manufacturing Survey. How much do we see a reacceleration in a manufacturing sector that has been flat on its back? That has been one of the questions. Is that going to meet up with services or are services going to come down to the manufacturing? Manufacturing, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, as John was mentioning. And today, regional bank earnings start rolling out uh, right ahead of Morgan Stanley and Bank of America. Tomorrow on Goldman Sachs, on Wednesday, we hear from the likes of FB Financial, Home Bancorp, Cross First Bank Shares, which John in particular is really tracking, Guarantee Bank Shares, Southern California Bank Corp. Tom has his eye on that one, and Bank First Capital. I'm trying. Neither of you are. You excited for that? <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for Tom show to tell me how bad this is for the small banks. I mean, he's he owns a high ground here at Keith Bridge. Yet in Woods, and I'm really to, to Lisa's great brief there. I, you know, this is not JP Morgan, these guys have other headaches. Some banks we've never heard of, yeah. Tom, it's like when we do March Madness and everyone talks about Gonzaga. <laughs> yes. I've never heard of Gonzaga in my life until the basketball tournament happens in March. That's and, why and then no basketball. one talks about Gonzaga for the rest of the year. You went to Gonzaga. <laughs> I'm sorry. Good morning, Washington <laughs> State. Michael Shaw, CEO of Marketfield Asset Management, joins us now for more. Michael, what a to catch up with you. You are one of those individuals who are looking for this rally to broaden out. Can you just walk us through your framework for thinking about the market and why you think we might be going in that direction? You know, I, I think people have been too negative all year about U.S. economic growth. Uh, I think they talked themselves into looking for a recession. Uh, yeah, I, I think as a result, a lot of the cyclical sectors haven't been terrible, but they haven't participated in this rally at all. There's a lot of the S&P still in the cyclical portion of, of it that, that is where it was last November, last December. Um, and you know, I, I think if we get some sign from management uh, that not only have earnings held up, but you know, if they took their guidance down last quarter and maybe they feel a little bit better about things, I, I think that that portion of the market can play catch up. Play that through what and where? Is that at the index level through the equal weight? Is that through banks, through energy? What is it? Um, you know, I, I don't think the banks are going to really surprise people. I think we're going to see the big banks have benefited from the small banks losing deposits. I, I, don't, I don't think that's shocking. Um, you know, I, I think energy does stand out as a as a cheap sector. If oil is is stable in that 75 to 85 range, um, so I think that that's one to look for. You know, Exxon took it, you know, took expectations down a couple of weeks ago, and I think we want to see whether they're being ultra conservative or whether there, there really has been a problem in you know in that sector. Um, and as I said, said this before, the disconnect between commodity producers and industrial equities is 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 unusual. The industrials have been a participator in in this rally. And a lot of the commodity producers they'd typically be tied to really haven't. So there's something to watch for. The, re the recessionistas point to manufacturing and what we see there, the numbers coming out of that sector, the sub-50 ISM for many months in a row. How do you dovetail that into this soft landing type of scenario with a broadening out, with potentially even participation from some of the manufacturing sector that's been beaten up? Yeah, well, you know, the ISM is an interesting survey. I, I mean, our, our theory is that what you're really seeing is is a broad slowdown in manufacturing rather than a deep slowdown. I mean, all, all you get from the ISM is basically are there more people saying things have got slightly worse or more people saying things have got slightly better? And and if it's just a lot of people saying, look, things were really unusually good a year, a year and a half ago, and they're not quite as good, but they're just fine, and that gives you a reading of 47. It's not the same as as as, as an early recession reading of 47. And that's the trouble with the ISM is is people don't distinguish between um, you know a, a, a rapidly deteriorating an environment, an environment which isn't just quite as good as people expected it to be. There's a tension, and it was uh, certainly present last week until Friday when everyone just threw up their hands and said, "Let's just buy everything." Mm -hmm. But I am concerned. Uh, probably Thursday more than Friday. But I am concerned about this polarization between 
this idea of an overheating economy with that strength that's defying all of the recessionistas versus inflation coming down miraculously, the sense that we will see that pressure and that the Fed doesn't have to go much further. Are those two ideas in conflict? I think it's a complicated economy, and you know, particularly you know, particularly post COVID. I'm I'm of a view that, that monetary policy hasn't really affected that much in the economy yet. Probably the biggest impact on inflation came from the decision to release the strategic petroleum reserve, because uh, you know, energy has been was a massive contributor to inflation on the way up and and has been on the way down. You know, I do think there's some impact of monetary policy on housing. You know, I think demand for housing has been crimped, and I think that's starting to feed through some of the data. But um, I think, you know, m m my view is that monetary policy was so ludicrously lax 18 months ago, two years ago, that we're only just getting to the point that it's, you know, having any kind of an impact on, on aggregate demand. This is so, so important, what you've just said. I've heard a few other people say the same thing. The inflation data came out last week. It was welcomed, celebrated, and it was good news. Let's yeah, be absolutely. clear on that. But I think too many people ran away <coughs> with the idea and said the Federal Reserve has been successful, they can back away. Are you saying if it hasn't started to bite, is that because this economy is more resilient or it's just not come through the pipeline yet? It, first of all, the economy is more resilient. Secondly, the long end of the curve hasn't transmitted any monetary tightening since September of last year. If you look at uh, the, the long-term Treasury yields or any, any kind of long-term credit yield, the, you know, the, you know, a, B, a triple B borrower isn't paying more to issue debt today than it was in September last year. So things can improve from here into next year? Is next year a better year based on everything you've just said? Um, I don't know if it's a better year for markets, but I, I, I think the economy is going to surprise people by its resilience. Michael Shaw of Marketfield Asset Management. Michael Trudy. Fantastic to catch up with you. Not the only one, Lisa, that I've heard saying this on the inflation data we've had so far. We need to have a bigger conversation about this. Yes, inflation is lower. It's softer. It's improving in terms of where we want it to be. But why? Why and what's taking it there? It's a great point. And if Fed policy hasn't taken effect yet, it's not their uh, boon to call. It's not their victory to call because it's not necessarily because of their policies. But what Michael was saying there also about longer term rates, that they have not been restrictive since September because of this rally in the long end, then does the Fed never really fully transmit its policy to an economy that keeps chugging along and just disinflated yeah. naturally, regardless of what they did. My, my basic take, and Christian Odendahl, the Reader of the Weekend, without question, and The Economist, on, quote, the delusion of manufacturing. And what's so important to me here with the delusion of manufacturing and that it's going to solve all of our problems is, just as you mentioned, Lisa, we're still at heart a service sector economy. And, and China may tend towards a service sector economy, but we are a service sector economy, and maybe there is a new manufacturing might. Rick Reader of BlackRock making the same point to our colleagues yeah. in Bloomberg News. If you are just tuning into the program, welcome to the program on the S&P 500 right now. We're slightly negative by 0.1%. Coming up at 8 a.m., so in about 48 minutes from now, look out for this conversation. We'll be catching up with David Balin of City Global Wealth, and I'll bring you that full quote from Rick Reader speaking to the team. Rick Reader from BlackRock, of course. I just think a recession is grossly overstated as a phenomenon today without some massive shock to the system. Now, bear in mind, we thought we had that shock back in March, April time, going oh. through the banking system, Tom, and we've quickly left behind concerns about that particular sector in this economy. Let's see if they return. David Balin, Andrew Sliman at, at Morgan Stanley, Michael Shaul, what's a common feature here? You got to be in the market, and if you establish out a more long-term view, you have to participate in enterprise. And right now, that enterprise is an American system, American corporations who are adapting and adjusting. And to Reader's point, without a shock, how do you get through a true MBER recession? And, you know, we don't give our opinion here, but I think all three of us have sort of pushed against that. You oh, mentioned Slim and Tom. Andrew yeah. Slim, and I spoke to him on Friday. Jay Pulaski as well. They've pointed out there's a ton of cash in money market funds. This is a first order condition. You don't have to bring Shola in and here tomorrow. Some people as well. want to put it to work. This is Larry McDonald, his essay in the second quarter was without question the essay of the quarter, which is the first order condition here is just the money out there that has to find a place. So if it does, that's argument one. They think it does. Argument two is where it goes. 
and yes. they believe it doesn't go to tech, oh. that maybe it goes elsewhere, which is Michael Shao's point. In, 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 in Lisa's world, I'm sorry, the, the credit spread realities of high yield, they, they're screaming a more efficacious Tight, outcome. tight, tight. Coming up in about an hour from now, the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Tariffs were put in place because we had concern with unfair trade practices on China's side. And our concerns with those practices remained. I would say it's premature um, to use this as an area for de-escalation, at least at this time. Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, speaking in India at the G20 Finance Minister's meeting in about an hour from now. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie speaking to the Treasury Secretary on that very address, a discussion about China and many things beyond that. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program this Monday morning and a very good morning to you. Equity slightly negative. We're down by 0.1 percent on the S&P 500. Once again, and I'm sure you're used to hearing me say this over the last week or so, we have a weaker dollar against the euro. 112.38 for the euro against the dollar and yields are lower here, Tom. We're down by five basis points. Your 10-year, 377.94. Again, watching the euro as well. I mean, it's buttressed up there. A euro breakout would really be something. We really haven't seen it yet, 112.37. But yes, it's a quiet tape, but it's sort of a on-the-watch quiet tape for what's supposed to be a quieter Monday. They're looking out for the ECB to potentially hike again, Tom. And then what next? Into what is, is, is well, really Recession right now in Germany. Yeah. Well, we could waste our time on that with Emery Horton. She's Bloomberg Euro on the Watch recession correspondent. But there's more important things to talk to Emery Horton about today than Mr. Gentilini and Madame Lagarde and all in Europe as well. There is a conversation with the Secretary of Treasury. Emery Horton, I am certain back to Washington, we have never had a Secretary of Treasury who understands the dynamics of our labor economy is this Secretary of the Treasury. Does Janet Yellen feel we've reached escaped velocity away from a recession? Well, that's a question we can potentially ask her in about an hour's time. But she has hinted that uh, they are in a good position potentially for this soft landing. But I think she's very prudent in the fact that she wouldn't take a recession off the table, especially this administration having dealt with in the past, coming out and potentially calling victory or trying to socialize that they thought inflation was transitory. I don't think they're going to come out and claim victory that they have this soft landing and that we're going to avoid a recession. But given the latest inflation data, that is something that is obviously top of their mind and hopefully uh, they're optimistic about it. And in their sense, I think one concern is, though, the what we're seeing out of China this morning and already Citigroup, we see they're cutting their GDP growth target target for China. What does this mean for the global economy? This is what is painting the backdrop of the G20 finance ministers and central bank bankers meeting uh, the Treasury Secretary is at in India. AMH, Mohammed al writing today that this market's been rallying gone. What hasn't happened? Let's talk about what <coughs> hasn't changed between the former administration and this administration around those tariffs that the Treasury Secretary was discussing. I imagine China's going to be top of mind for you and the Treasury Secretary in about 60 minutes from now. What's happening with those tariffs? It certainly is. They're still conducting and they're almost, uh, almost at the finish line of this review of the tariffs. Uh, but, John, the point you make is really important. This administration, the Biden administration, not only kept the Trump era tariffs in line, especially at a time when inflation was incredibly high and economists said that could be one tool in the toolbox to use to bring inflation down. They still kept them in place. And not only that, they're really doubling down when it comes to their ex their executive order they're starting to potentially lift as this summer, potentially as soon as end of July when it comes to outbound investment and other penalties or sanctions on China or export controls on China. So what you see is the Treasury Secretary coming out and saying they want to de-escalate. But right now, 
when you see a tit-for-tat potentially on the economic front between China and Beijing, that does not bode well for any sort of de-escalation. And add to that, Anne-Marie, the fact that she is speaking from India, where she has visited three times in the past nine months, and talks about the incredibly close friendship and the friendshoring that she hopes uh, to transpire in India, moving potentially away from China. How does that messaging go over in China? How does she try to finesse over that reality? Well, I think it's um, no surprise to Chinese authorities what the United States has been doing. And after this, she'll be going to Vietnam as well. She has been really a stalwart when it comes to this idea of friendshoring and nearshoring and wanted to make sure that their supply chain, especially after COVID-19, but also what the administration talks as national security concerns when it comes to supply chains in China, that they want to diversify. I'd also note that India is this uh, really critical player. I mean, Modi just got a state visit to the United States as well. Uh, as you mentioned, Yellen, she's visited there three times in nine months, mean, meaning in her whole tenure as Treasury Secretary, she has not visited any other place as much as she has India. Um, they're going to be hosting the Leader Summit in September. India is going to be the presidency around this. And they are in a mm -hmm. very difficult position because they are still conducting a tremendous amount of trade with Russia. And at the same time, the U.S. wants to make sure that they are in line with how they view the world order. Yeah, Marie, the heritage of Janet Yellen is from Brown to Yale under the giant James Tobin. Joe Stiglitz and Ted Truman were hugely influential on her, and she was renowned for her acuity, her, 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 her immediacy of her Yellen notes. They literally were called Yellen notes when she was in a meeting with Tobin or, or whatever. How are her Yellen notes on China received in the Oval Office? Is anybody at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue paying attention to Professor Yellen? Certainly they are. I think there's been a little bit of a diversion with how Treasury would see the relationship with China versus how the White House would see the relationship with China. Obviously, this comes down to an issue like the tariffs. The issue with the tariffs really becomes an issue with one of economics versus politics. Um, a lot of economists, I imagine some in the Treasury Department, would say that it would be prudent if you want to ease up on inflation to lift the Trump era tariffs. But obviously, that would be politically toxic for this administration, especially going into an election next year. Now, she said it was pre it's premature to say they're on the table. Uh, but potentially, this is something that this administration is looking at yet again. I would find it hard to see them now that we're seeing inflation cooling and we are going into an election cycle that now would be the time. It seems like the boat has missed in terms of lifting those tariffs. But I think that is where you could see some of the tension between uh, this White House and the Treasury Department. Just to give Tom an extra an extra question here, and I'll ask one for him. Amory, I think he's asking the right question. There was a view over the last couple of years that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen had almost been sidelined in this administration. I think we've talked about her potential departure 10 different times over the last 24 months. Mm -hmm. What's happening now? Is she in the fold? Is she having a bigger voice in this White House? Well, I think the Treasury Secretary, she's been used... Um, as an important aide when they're trying to have this re-engagement when it comes to China. Obviously, we had uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken go first. I think the U.S. administration wanted to set this tone that we have serious issues when it comes to your support of Putin, uh, when it comes to Taiwan. But then, of course, they're also these are also the two biggest economies in the world. And the administration understands that the rest of the world wants to see how they have a dialogue and how they can uh, communicate. So her, she was really there as an aide as well to explain what was going to be coming down on the pipeline. Um, and in that sense, she's definitely a safe pair of hands. I think one criticism of the Treasury Secretary is that we all know her in the Bloomberg world um, as an academic, as a Fed chair, not so much as a politician. AMH, you'll be speaking to the Treasury Secretary in about 45 minutes, we're looking forward to the conversation. Anne-Marie sitting down with the U.S. Treasury Secretary, Jana Yellen, live and exclusive on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. AMH used this word premature. City using the same word this morning. We've talked a lot about the soft landing hopes and dreams. Andrew Honhorst over his city, he says all that talk, that optimism is premature. Yeah. Tom, tight labour markets, elevated wages, upside risk to shelter and other services inflation mean we do not share... 
the optimism. Same page as Alarian. It's like we're all looking out and guessing, guessing, but really that's what the markets try to do. Triple levers dot cash. I, I just five percent doesn't I get sound out so front good. And look at Morgan Stanley. You think an odd into Morgan Stanley to dip my toes in? Oh, the is water? that what you're thinking? Into thinking. earnings? Uh, Forty-two shares. Into earnings tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. From New York. Maybe. I don't this know. is Bloomberg. No drama this morning. Stocks down just a touch on the S&P. We're negative by 0.1% on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq totally unchanged after a decent week of gains on both the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, biggest week of gains in around about a month. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, shaping up as follows. A two-year right now down another four basis points, 4.72.33. On a 10-year down five to 3.78.52. Lots of happy talk about soft landings just last week. Validated by some of the data, at least so far so good for that view at the moment. Let's see what this week brings. Retail sales tomorrow morning. We talked about Andrew Hollenhorst, the city moments ago, pushing back against that view. I'll give you some more on that. Soft landing optimism is premature. Andrew and the team saying, absent a tightening of financial conditions, inflation may re-accelerate in early 2024. Whatever your view on this, I'm sure we can all agree we're sick to death of talking about it. And I think there's some hopes in 2024 we won't be anymore. So if Andrew's right, TK, there's more of this to come. There's more of this to come. And I, I get that we have to rationalize for it, all of us, with the sum of all of our fears of the market. And, you know, I get it. It's a healthy exercise. But the phrasing wrapped around we just have to wait for the data yeah it's just comical retail sales I'm tomorrow sorry. morning that's your next big data point it's fairly quiet on that front on the data front quiet yeah. on the fed speak front as well they're in the quiet period they went into that on saturday ahead of next week's federal reserve decision on wednesday looking potentially for another rate hike from them and then it's on to the earnings from bank of america yeah. morgan stanley tomorrow goldman sachs on wednesday tom i want to finish on the euro it's eight days of this now yeah eight consecutive it's days the number of one thing i'm watching and muted I, I mild moves Right. But just the euro it's grinding out another one. Grinding up. And I notice on China weakness as well, Brent crude, global oil from an 80 level back to 78.9. Well, what's really important here is Bramo. When, you know, we dive into stocks and what they're doing. Bramo's going to control the truth. Oh, really? That's what she's doing now. Oh, right. She's controlling the truth. Mm. She's really? The truth around what markets or the, the, the truth. Mission she's, Impossible? She's controlling the truth. I feel like you watched Paramount. Mission Impossible. No, well, You're giving me the impression that you watched that movie at we, the weekend. Full disclosure, folks, with the show millions of years ago on TV, our world stopped on Friday evening. For Mission Impossible. I'll get there. It stopped. The autocracy of market movers. Let's get to it. Please. I want to first start with Chewy, and this one's for you, Tom. Please. Because I know that Multiple you're orders this very weekend. It's sort of the newsflash of the what moment is all those pets that people uh, adopted during the pandemic still have to be fed. Uh, the shares of Chewy were up 210% during 2020, and then they were down about yeah. uh, more than 30% in the following two years. Those shares <clears> up <throat> almost 5% after Goldman Sachs raised a recommendation that profit margins would expand because because Tom Keen was going to be spending the most possible unorganic it's, dog food. You know, in the walk-up, the Chewy-thon <laughs> across the four bedroom, well, four, four rooms, the two bedrooms of four rooms is unbelievable. Their whole racket is nothing I deal with, John. Can you do with few clicks to spend more money than Chewy? It's They've nailed the whole clicky Amazon, thing. Amazon, same thing, just, you know, Chewy's better. Swipe, purchase now, just yeah. buy. They, they Chewy's, Chewy's better. Money. It's Chewy's like, better. It's like a dating app, except for and, dog And the food. dog food just keeps, you know, vet bill will only have chicken. The dog food just keeps going up. It's like two bucks a month planned. Well, up and up. But continue, please. Speaking of prices going up, Tesla looks like it's going to be potentially on its fifth day of gains. It's coming, it's up about 2.2%. The why for that? Well, you can see some gains in uh, Chinese electric vehicle manufacturers, but because sales are coming in strong. You also have the first cyber truck rolling off the production line as it, at its Giga Texas plant, the cyber truck that I know John will drive. And then here is what you've been waiting for the whole uh, day since John teased his review yep. imminent on Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Those shares lower by 2.8 percent, I'll just say, because the box office numbers weren't as good. So the review. Yeah, $56 million in theaters at the weekend. I think people were looking for something upwards of maybe something into the 70s. It felt like you were watching part one of part two. 
and and that's, that's what it good. is. And that's, 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 that's never good when never you have good. that experience. I also got the feeling at one point, you mentioned Grace, played by Hayley Atwell, the English actors. I got the feeling at one point that it felt like maybe that he was going to hand it over, hand over the, the franchise to a new, a new lead. There was some talk a while ago she, about Ethan Hunt taking a maybe taking a backward step and letting the character play out its last movie. I understand based on the success of Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones that maybe Tom Cruise is going to stick around. Yeah. He's a long you know, way you from what, You see what you can do now with, with a certain graphics to make you look younger, TK? <laughs> I, I you can go low. back to 1996 yeah. Tom Cruise and just sort of like keep churning out, John, don't yeah, exactly. keep churning out the movies. Yeah, don't give away my about. secrets. <laughs> but, but, you know, I'm actually 65 am, and I've been doing this for 30 years. Thank you. I, I'm as, I'm as I'm less qualified on this than anyone out there except everybody, including, is it Miss Adams that plays Grace? raves about Cruz's skills in his intensity of making film. Oh, the stunts they are, rave just the stunt that he does when him. he goes off the edge of the cliff and he's not showing up, you know, they, they use in the that chair. for the publicity tour. Yeah. It's very cool. It's yeah. very cool what he's still yeah. doing. What did the buy, what a thing of popcorn cost? I didn't buy any. Are you kidding? Of course he didn't buy any. Popcorn. I didn't buy any. No. You know, I like to sometimes I, I like to get popcorn and put little pieces of chocolate in it, you know. Just what? How long ago? Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, no. I did that 18 months ago. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> last specific. year. A couple of times. Popcorn. Okay. popcorn. A couple of times. And... Winter programming in the summer. Okay. You know. Yeah, yeah, do they have popcorn you know, in, in the movie winter, theaters absolutely. in yeah. England? <laughs> do they do? Popcorn they do. Yeah. Of course they do. We have popcorn. Okay. What do you think England is? The Dark Ages. I don't know. I'm just asking. Did we get popcorn? Do you, guys, know, hey. you know, do you guys have moving pictures, or are they still still over We're there? We're doing black so and white. Can you do the same for Barbie? Can you go <laughs> Lauren see Barbie? Lauren Hardy is and, still yeah, exactly still around. Can you can Bring you go see out. Barbie and give us a review? If as you well? buy the tickets, yeah. You know, Deborah, let's Cunning. go and watch Barbie together. Uh, yeah, please, we'll do that for so sure. <laughs> Saving the show right now uh, is Deborah Cunningham, Global Liquidity Market CIO at Federated Hermes. This is an important conversation. We talked to Stephen Auth the other day on the equity side of the Federated Shop. And he made clear that a long time frame is necessary. With the bond losses over the last 36 months, 24 months, whatever it is, the pandemic bond losses, what is your time frame to recover in the bond market? Well, we think that we're not going back to zero rates. So recovery back to that sort of a low is unlikely. You're going to have maturities and um, a bottom that's probably more like three, three and a half, maybe maybe even four percent, depending upon where inflation is allowed to settle in. Um, our expectation is that that's at least a year in the making. As you know, um, Tom, we are looking for something that's higher for longer. Um, our expectation from the Fed is a move at the end of this month and maybe another yeah. one in September or November. But in either case, we're looking at rates that are five plus percent for quite right. a period of time, at least into the middle part of 2024. And as such, that means the bond market is recovering on a mild basis like it is now, but it's not right. going to be the full recovery for a while. The mission impossible of the bond market is to get retail enthusiasm. Retail enthusiasm's, uh, enthusiasm is how much Apple can I own right now? When it, what's the process to get back to a bond enthusiasm among retail? You know, I think right now retail enthusiasm for the um, cash cash investor or the fixed income investor is cash. And that's because they were woken up about, you know, the, their deposits in banks being zero, 25, 50 basis points not that long ago by SVB and Signature. So they went into money market funds. Their next move is into call it ultra shorts. Then from ultra shorts, they go a little bit longer at the curve. But that all takes time. The, 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 the retail um, investor right now from a cash perspective in the fixed income market is short and really probably won't be getting long until there is some plateau reach and maybe even the first rate cut, you know, not until the first rate cut that we see from the Fed. This is fascinating, Deborah, and it answers a question we've been asking throughout the program, Tom and John, talking about when are people going to take the money that they've been stashing in money market funds and start putting it into equities or other risky securities. Are you saying that you're not seeing any signs of that? And for the most part, people are just very happy cashing in uh, on those coupons. 
Absolutely happy, especially on the retail trade. And quite honestly, Lisa, the institutional side of the market hasn't really even come into the um, into the money market fund products yet. They are in direct security still. They're in repo. They're in short term paper. And it's because they're institutional in nature and they have the ability to purchase direct securities that when a Fed is raising rates, they uh, you know, have the ability to, to, to be on top of those rates right away, whereas a money market fund may lag by 30 or 40 days. So the institutional trade hasn't happened yet. That will happen when re rates peak and start to go down. The retail trade is still on in full force. So given that, are you concerned when you hear people say things like there's a lot of money on the sidelines because it's not really on the sidelines? It's actually in an incredibly lucrative instrument called cash-like securities or money market? You know, it doesn't. It, it, it's it's a good thing. Um, we've seen these patterns occur before. I think people will watch earnings. People will understand what's happening from an economic perspective just from their own, um, you know, day to day happenings. What, what they are paying at the gas pump, what they're paying at the grocery store, what they're paying in rents or mortgages, where their interest rates are. So I think it's a natural thing for retail to, um, you know, sort of lead into the short end of the market. But I also think it's kind of natural for them to lead into the longer end of the market, too. But they don't do it in, you know, a, a U-turn. It's something that is a gradual process. So it's not particularly worrisome. We try to keep our finger much more on the pulse of what's happening from an economic and an earnings perspective and the issuers that we're using. Deborah, thank you. Deborah Cunningham there, a Federated Hermes. There was a view at the start of the year that you wanted to be in cash. You could get 4 to 5%, maybe more, in some places. And then, Tom, all of a sudden, the equity market happened and the dominance of big tech. And I know it sounds cliche, but capital goes to where it's treated best. And there is a feeling at the moment that so far it's been treated best in equities. And we'll see who wins out is in the next a, six is, months. Is it, is it a modern view of fear of missing out? I, I mean, the basic idea is, you, you know, you get your 401k, or in the case of uh, myself, a 201k, you look at the thing, and the bond markets are up 2%, cash is up 4%, and, you know, I, I mean, even a Midland S&P portfolio is up, what, 9 11 12%, and that's what feeds the retail enthusiasm. We mentioned Rick Reeder earlier of BlackRock and how he doesn't see a recession Given that, you would think, oh, so is he going all in on uh, in equities or in riskier bonds? And he said, one of the beautiful things today at investing is you can own the front end yielding assets. I bought some commercial paper the other day at six and a half percent, one year CP, six and a half percent. It's like, I just want to go home at six and a half percent and just yeah. sit. When, when, does the money Sleep market, well when, <laughs> when does the money market frenzy stop? I don't understand why anyone would move out of five point X percent money market fund. Well, if you can get a better offer at the equity yeah, market, just, Tom, that's what's going to change the conversation. You almost need a PhD in psychology right now. If you've not been in this market and you've been yeah, sat in cash fair. and you've watched these big games, what are you talking this about is me why again? your bad no, mouth is shady. Again. This is why Slimmon shady. and Pulaski think that if the money comes in from money market funds, it goes to where the gains haven't been because I'm they're not, going to feel foolish chasing big I, tech. Look, it's not my view. There's just a range of views I, out there at the moment. Tom. I've got to stop by. I need Dow thirty six thousand to consider this. Okay, that's what you're waiting for. All right. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program where we don't quote the Dow Jones, we quote the S&P 500, which is um, a negative <laughs> by 0.13%. Looking forward to catching up with Greg Dacko, the chief economist at EY Parthenon. We'll do that at 8.30 Eastern time, so 50 minutes from now. About 30 minutes from now, you will hear from the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, alongside Bloomberg's Anne-Marie in an exclusive conversation. TK, I have to say, I think we're all looking forward to this one, aren't we? On China, Janet Yellen. It's not going to be just one sentence. It's going to be what Anne-Marie could crowbar out of her about the path forward here, not only the domestic challenges and the debt that we talked about, not so much what the market's going to do, but, you know, the domestic challenges we have into an election season, but the overlay of international economics. And to be blunt, she's better qualified on this than anyone in the administration. On the path forward as well for this week, not just the economic data, retail sales tomorrow, Morgan Stanley and Bank of America report earnings in the morning, and then it's on to the likes of Goldman Sachs on Wednesday. In just a moment, we'll catch up with Tom Show of KBW on the banking sector. Tom, the last time we caught up with him was a few months ago. And let's just say the conversation around the banking sector was very, very different a few months ago. It was brutal. And the first question will be, what is the level right now of angst among smaller banks, way below the super regionals, or dare I say the big four? Not as brutal now. 
Equities softer by 0.1% on the S&P. Year to date, the S&P 500 up around 17%. The Nasdaq 100 up around 42% year to date. From Never New York, this is Bloomberg. Was firing on all cylinders. It's J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, it's just incredible. Citigroup's on the on the right course, but investors have been burnt waiting. We have a, a stable or healthy economy, uh, even with rates and some deposit spreads narrowing. Uh, it's a pretty good picture for banks. That's the view from Ken Leon of CFRA. It's the view of others as well. Following earnings from J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo and City on Friday tomorrow morning, as we said repeatedly through this morning so far, you'll hear from Morgan Stanley and Bank of America. Goldman Sachs rounded things out on Wednesday. Tons of regional banks you've never heard of that Bramos talked about a few times already this morning coming through today as well. In the equity market, a bit softer. We're negative by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Not really going anywhere. It's a quiet churn in the equity market, at least so far. In the bond market, we just resumed this move lower in yields. It continues. We're down five basis points, Tom. The 10-year at 378. Yields are lower. The dollar's weaker. Euro's positive against the US dollar. We're now looking at 112.36. And again, over the last couple of days, just new highs for the year, new highs for the year, new euro strength for 2023. Bloomberg Surveillance folks committed to giving you the best of the earnings season. Lisa really driving forward our coverage there, as she mentioned in the brief this morning. Uh, and we're really thrilled with our coverage Friday of the big banks. There'll be, what, more coverage tomorrow? Tomorrow, John. Looking big forward banks, to it. Yeah. Wednesday. And then we're big done. Banks. Then we're done. No, we're not. Thomas Show joins us now. He's the chief executive officer of KBW, Keith Briat and Woods, a Stiefel company. And he understands this American banking system truly like no one uh, we speak to. Off the market, off the March shock, the Keith Briads and Wood index, I'm stunned by this. Off a dead cat bounce is up all of 4% off of the middle of March shock. I thought it would have done much better. Why are the broader indexes of banks, why is it lagging? It, it's lagging mainly because the market's unsettled about what the earnings is going to be for the regional banks and for the banks. And there's a reset underway. The first reset is around net interest income and what's happening with deposit costs. I thought it was very interesting that when you looked at the big bank earnings on Friday, which were actually pretty good relative expectations, the stock still went down across the sector. And it's because the view is that we're not there yet in terms of understanding how this remixing is happening in, in, in deposits. Some of the good news is that we're really not seeing big shoes drop on credit. Um, but that also continues to be uh, a concern. So I think, you know, KBW for our 2024 estimates for banks, we've cut estimates 20 percent in the last six months. And I think investors want to know when is that going to stop? When, when is this reset to profitability going to stop? Could you help us understand just the size of those banks when you come out with a number like that, 20 percent drop? It's, in the, estimates, it's all it's the way the through ones. the industry. All the way through the end. That's up and down. small to large, just up and down. So right just a, if I were to talk about dynamics, if you're just a spread income lender alone, you have more pressure. But don't forget, we think this second quarter is going to be a very difficult quarter for investment banking. Um, they did maybe a smidgen better than we thought, but still, let's just say down 20 percent at least. Uh, year over year. Now, we're seeing green shoots in investment banking. That's only about half a dozen or so companies where that really matters. Um, the other banks are just feeling the full brunt of the spread compression, which also impacts the bigger banks, even though the biggest banks are faring better. Have you been surprised by how quickly we've left behind the events of March, April time? I, I, I am, which is in, in good and bad. It's good because the American banking industry is really resilient and these were idiosyncratic risks, and I think we've proven that. But at the same time, we need the right reform. And, and um, actually, in the last quarter, I did testify in front of Congress, and I was urging deposit insurance reform. Instead, we're getting capital increases, which uh, I think are going to create unintended consequences and be a whole nother dynamic. How idiosyncratic, though, was it? And I ask this at a time when a lot of people are studying commercial real estate, including the St. Louis Federal Reserve, which accounts for about half of all loans on smaller banks' balance sheets. And we're looking at a potential record of maturities, maturing commercial real estate loans this year. 
How do you dovetail that into future weakness that we could start to see in this earnings cycle? So, and I remember the last time we were on, we talked about this. So we have a commercial real estate research group and, and higher rates are going to hurt commercial real estate values everywhere in the country. But the ones we're most worried about are the cities and the cities where they have the big properties. That's where you're seeing the biggest stress in terms of occupancy in particular, where we think that the, the hits may be the biggest. Uh, big news out of Friday, Wells Fargo took their reserve for those type of properties to 9%. 9%, that's a big number for a bank after you think about all the equity that's already in those projects. So that's pretty big. So, But but we had a regional bank that we took around in New York recently to meet investors, about a $40 billion bank. Their median commercial real estate loan was a million dollars and almost none of it in a city. So we feel better about that. And if that describes what a regional bank's por portfolio looks like, there'll be pressure, but nothing like these big cities where that, they're going to be bigger hits. The last time you were on, we talked a lot about consolidation. You did expect a wave of consolidation among smaller banks. Do you feel differently now that evidently the crisis is over and everything has changed? Or do you feel like we're going to see an ongoing churn of consolidation that hasn't yet transpired? I, I, I think we're going to see consolidation, A, because it's just been the trend for the last couple of decades. Then you ask yourself, why would that happen? Well, it would happen because the costs of regulation continue to go up. And one way to be able to afford it is either to have more scale or to merge with a bank that already has it. So that way you don't have to build it yourself and that makes the system more sound. Also, over time, healthy banks tend to acquire banks that are not performing as well. And that's a healthy step that also happens. Then I think lastly is, and this is a bigger story, is over the last decade plus, especially since Dodd-Frank, um, you've seen non-bank lenders pick up market share. We did a report earlier this year where we think banks have about half of the market. Every time capital ratios go up, Vice Chairman Barr talked about a two percentage point change. That's going to benefit non-banks. Jamie Dimon talked about that in his call on Friday. And, and that's what's going to happen. And that world is unregu less regulated. I wouldn't say unregulated. Less regulated. Tom, Michelle, all of us on the racket have a bank we just follow. I'm not going to mention the bank, but it's a pure mediocrity of a small bank, and it's called Bank X. Bank X in the last 10 years has delivered 2.2% shareholder return. In the last 20 years, Bank X has returned 1.4% 20 years. Are these guys not put out of their misery because they're protected by an umbrella of government support? Back to Andrew Jackson. When do you, Sandler O'Neill and the rest of them, when do you roll these dogs up? Well, I'll tell you what's interesting is in some cases there may not be a buyer. There's a chance there may not be a buyer. And as technology continues to evolve and there's less branch traffic, for example, um, some of these companies may find there's just not the buyer that so they what think do they is do? there. What, what does Bank X do in their 20-year garbage mediocrity kept afloat, not by KBW, but kept afloat by government regulation? Well, I, and I think the other thing is that should that company need capital because, let's say, they have a bad loan or they need to make an investment, investors are going to look at that. And an industry where where investors don't have strong incentive to invest, if the if that company, and I think this applies to any industry, but if there isn't a return, they're not going to have the access to the capital that the government and the regulators would like. You need a healthy industry I, up and this down. This is a uniquely American thing, John. I, this is just, I'm sorry. And, and the big thing is so, you know, and I get a lot of questions saying, hey, other countries have five or six big banks. You know, we have four really big ones. It would be great if we had 15 to 25 big ones. And then you'd have really good choice and really good competition. And then some of those local banks will still be critical to their local communities. I think it's that middle. Here, I'll give you another number. 97% of the banking industry in America is below $10 billion in assets. That means there are 140 banks above $10 billion. We're actually approaching the end game where you can start to really pay attention as to how this might play out. I've got 30 seconds. When you went in front of Congress, did you get the impression they wanted to make sensible policy or just punish this sector? Um, I would say the majority, not the entirety, but the majority uh, was they were thinking about steps that they could take. But I felt as if they were going to address issues that weren't solely Silicon Valley and other bank failures, and the chances for unintended consequences were high. And I think you really got to, because if you push too hard, you're, you're going to benefit the non-bank industry. And I think we could be headed in that direction. Tell me, Chuck. 
Thank you. That was incredibly KBW. Diplomatic. It's a diplomatic response. Yeah, you think? I mean, the question, <laughs> not so much. They often aren't. <laughs> David Balin <laughs> of City Global Wealth coming up very shortly. Tom Lovett, as always, just Great wonderful. Great to be with you. Thank you. On the Banks TK, what a year it's been already for Wall Street and beyond. It's just fabulous. All the small banks want to do, John, is go to lunch with Tom Michaud. That's the only reason they're in business. You know, they just want to go. Been tough, they want Tom. to go to the restaurant on top of the Ritz Carlton, the old Ritz Carlton in Boston, and hang out and put it on KBW's tab. I thought you said they want to go and play golf and then go. And they play lunch. golf. They go out to Brookline Country Club and say, "Tom, here's how we do it." 10 a.m. tea time. Yeah, yeah. Well, Middlebury Golf Team you on, know. on the early side of things. <laughs> Janet Yellen coming up shortly. the view that in the long run, inflation will be able to settle back to 2%. I think conditions are starting to be in place for capital markets to really open up in the back half of the year. Given where spreads and rates are, you don't want to get aggressive. We think higher rates will slowly start to bite in towards the third quarter of this year. Look, the Fed have effectively told us they'll go in July. The market is discounting it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Commercial free to most of you for a good part of this hour, a conversation with the Secretary of Treasury, John Henry Horton, with many questions on China as well. China, 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 and Chinese growth overnight disappointing. We've talked about the downgrades to the outlook for economic growth in the world's second largest economy. They come this morning from the likes of Citi, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Sokgen, and others. I'd like to return to this quote from Sokgen this morning. They've taken down their expectations for China from 5.5% to 5%. Mm -hmm. And they say this, this can only be achievable if the government continues to step up easing measures. JP Morgan, Miss Laf Mateka publishing this morning, he says keep fading this China stimulus story. He thinks we're in deflation, Tom, and ultimately you're going to need something big, something really big right. to address the property market in China. Janet Yellen knows the China of a go, which is 6, 7, dare I say 8% GDP. We're not seeing that now, but we see it, John, with a deflationary, disinflationary impulse out of the Pacific giant. And you show that through Brent crude 80 down to 78.88. Even Brent crude gives way. So the inflationary numbers pointing to weaker growth in China. The inflationary numbers in the United States were welcomed by this market last week. Softer CPI, softer PPI. There are some hopes that this continues and that ultimately the Fed will be able to back away. Now, some people think this soft landing conversation is premature. Andrew Hollenhorst, the city, is one of them. He's saying in 2024, you can have this dynamic where inflation reaccelerates. I would say this, just something to explore through this morning. Let's say Andrew's right. Andrew's going to be dead right and inflation's going to reaccelerate in early next year. What can you do with that information as a market participant right now, which is why Mohamed al Erin's made the point on Friday that this is a narrative that for now, you don't want to fight TK in the markets. It's a bond dynamic. And to me, Lisa, and this is the wheelhouse you've been so right on, is the credit spread market away from full faith and credit. What are other bonds doing? How did they respond over the last 36 uh, uh, trading hours to what we see? Well, as Kelsey Barrow was saying, perhaps not the leading indicator that they once were. We were talking earlier about credit spreads, particularly with respect to the lowest rated securities the tightest right now, going back more than a year to April. So it's having the same kind of trend that we're seeing in the stock market. Which is support. Which is support, strength, yeah. not a default cycle. Here's the thing. If we do get a Hollenhorst reacceleration of inflation, which some people are calling for, and everybody, yeah, and everybody is ignoring the University of Michigan survey going out that you saw the inflation expectations tick up, and maybe rightly so. But either way, people today are ignoring that. Then do you start to see some chipping away at the strength that we've seen so far with now concerns about an overheating economy once again? I mean, I don't think we're going to hear overheating economy from uh, Janet Yellen today. But this linkage, as Catherine Mann of the Bank of England and Brandeis would say, is codependency with China can't be can't be emphasized enough, John. I mean, here we are at this moment with Secretary of Yellen, and I wonder how alone in a bipartisan Washington that can't stand Beijing. The seat has changed for Janet Yellen, so the view has to some degree as well. Tom, the challenge for anyone in that seat right now is how do you balance your economic objectives with national security concerns held by, say, the national security advisor in the same administration. And TK, that's always going to be the challenge on coming up with the right policy, not just for the economy, but for national security as well. And ultimately, that's the challenge of anyone that's going to sit in the White House for the foreseeable future. Right. 
Do a mini brief here, Lisa, with the economic data this week. What matters for Secretary Yellen? What matters for this discussion on China? Well, retail sales will be really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, she's also going to be looking just in general about the housing markets. I mean, these are some of the things coming out domestic of uh, the yeah. domestic things. Uh, but really, I think what everyone's looking at is the earnings and that for China as well. Right. And I know that Janet Yellen has had a lot of discussions with right. businesses in the United States about what they're trying to do, how they're planning to work with China. Yeah. Reshore, near shore, et cetera. Things are terrible, John. Into the data check, SPX 4,500, Dow 34,600, NASDAQ beckons to 16,000. Things are just oh, terrible. Things have been ugly all year, Tom. They're just terrible. It's just, it's just terrible. Equities a bit softer. Yields a little lower. We're down five basis points on a 10-year, 378.52. The euro stronger for an eighth consecutive session. That is the longest <clears throat> run of euro strength against the U.S. dollar going all the way back to June 2020. Tom, it has been a while since we've seen this grind. And I have to say it's been a grind, kind of relentless. It's another 0.05% yeah. today. John Farrell mentions Jay Pulaski and others. We are peopling our discussion with people of vintage who have seen this before. Michael Shaul had with us earlier. Uh, any number of others, including our Gina Martin Adams. Joining us now of experience, David Balin, CIO at City Global Wealth. Uh, David, it's not that we've been here before. To me, it's absolutely original. But what is the character of this bull market? Well, it's a bull market, I think, born of a variety of things. Number one, a lot of exceeding expectations. You know, we, we had started the year expecting that there'd be an energy crisis in Europe that didn't happen. The banking crisis, you know, that you've discussed this morning didn't turn out to be a banking crisis. Uh, growth turned out to be better than expected. And ultimately, what we saw is really, you know, inflation coming down meaningfully. And I think it's very hard to make the argument that next year inflation goes up. What will the source of that be? The last remnants of inflation really are in the area of housing and of rental costs. And we see that, you know, it is possible for us to get to a 2 to 2.5% inflation rate in 2024. Now, you take all of that mix and you think about where we started the year from investor positioning. We had huge bearish short positions, much worse than we saw in 2008 and 2009. And we had $1.25 trillion of money sitting in money market funds of people waiting to invest, or at least thinking they were waiting to invest. And then ultimately what happened, we had this you know, innovative moment where you know, all of a sudden the talk became about artificial intelligence and the impact that mm -hmm. it would have markets. That is the combination that's brought us here. And also you know, the backdrop in 2022 is that this was an extremely rare year, only in 1931, and in 1969, did we see markets, both equity and debt, go down at the same time? So lots of factors, right, right have been contributed to where we are right now. And where we go forward, of course, I think is a little bit more difficult because so much optimism is built, built into the market at these levels. Do you have enough combined information from your securities analysts to say yet that we have a better revenue growth line because of a better nominal GDP? Not really, Tom. You know, what our view is that next year we're going to be, you know, one half of 1% higher in GDP in the U.S. It's going to take time for momentum to build. We consider this to be like a rolling recession. So if you imagine that a sharp recession would have a V like this and last for six months, we think this recession is probably a 15-month length and it's just like a, solo, a shallow trough. And if that's the case, it's going to take a while for us to have, you know, a building momentum. But what markets are looking to now is what's going to happen in 2024. And, and it's not going to be 2023 where we see revenue growth. It's going to have to be next year because, again, I think these next two quarters are going to be somewhat challenging. In the meantime, David, you said that you're raising your allocation to global equities. Where in particular? When did you start to make a more uh, meaningful shift on the heels of better than expected data? We have made two emerging markets moves. The first one was to Brazil, a specific allocation there. And then subsequently, about a week and a half ago, we added emerging market debt to our portfolios. We really want everyone to you know, think about their cash position a lot and to think about moving from cash and taking some duration risk now, You know, five or six year duration risk, capture the yields that you're getting in your money market fund today for the next five to six years. And in emerging markets, if you don't take a lot of credit risk, you can actually get you know, yields of seven to 8%. And that to us is very attractive if we expect inflation, in fact, to be to two and a two and a half percent next year. How much is that really predicated on the idea of a dollar continuing to weaken? Well, last week was a very important signal, and you've touched upon this in your conversation today. I mean, the dollar really took a move once inflation, the inflation print came out last week. 
And I think that's indicative of what the world's expecting, right? The U.S. is a much more active, you know, uh, central bank than Europe does. Uh, they expect that rates in the United States will come down when they need to. Whereas if you think about the European central banks, they're going to keep their policies pretty constant. And if that's the truth, then you've already seen, you know, the beginning of, a, of the weakening dollar. And we think that that trend could last for several years from here and that the dollar could be considerably weaker if we were to look out 18 months. Uh, I'm told the public is pushing against 6040. David Balin, does 6040 work in 2024 and 2025? I'm really back in love with 6040, Tom. Um, I think that investors have to think about it this way. You're getting paid now for the first time in a very long time to hold a you know medium duration bond portfolio. If you can make it you know five percent or five and a half percent doing that for five or six years, or you want to take more risk, you can you can really you know earn some terrific yields in emerging markets and in private credit. You should be doing that right now because that is going to have diversification as compared to your equity portfolio. And the second thing people have to be mindful of is that they need to think about the value that they're getting in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I believe we're in a, you know, in a recovery in 24, a more meaningful recovery. You want to have small and medium sized right. stocks. You want to diversify into areas even like China, right, which are counter cyclical, uh, which are trading at incredibly low values uh, and, and for right. good reason. You know? But ultimately, you've got to be forward looking in your portfolio construction and diversification really is the only free lunch that you right. get on Wall Street. And we think we need to see more of it, less U.S. Right. interest. David, one final question and quickly, unfortunately. David Balin, are we clipping coupons or can we actually own that debt portion for total return? I really think it's the right now, actually, I think you can get it for total return. You're being paid a lot of money to, you know, if you can capture three or four percent real interest rates a year and a half from now, that is an exciting prospect relative to where we've been for the last 11 years. So I do think it, it contributes meaningfully both to risk reduction and to the total return time. And we're emphasizing that to our clients. We're actually seeing some real movement, you know, at, uh, at the private bank into, you know, into these areas where, where clients are finally saying, wow, I've just got too much cash. You know, I, I can actually put money to work and sustain my yields. David, I just think for a lot of people that have been trapped in cash this year, and I say trapped in cash only relative to the gains we've seen elsewhere in the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, if they're going to come back in, they feel foolish chasing big tech. What do you say to those people? Well, we have to divide that up, right? So first of all, our clients have been sitting there for 10 years waiting to come back into the markets. So there's always <laughs> this idea that you can outsmart the markets, right? You know, and, and so the difference between now and any time in the last 10 years is that you want to capture a real yield, right? And, and you need to do that now because, you know, when we're talking about it in three or six months, this opportunity may go away with that much cash on the sidelines. In terms of the whole concept of the technology trade, really, if you think about that, take a look at the valuation of the NASDAQ at 26 plus times or the S&P at 21, there are parts of the market that you can actually invest in that are trading at 15 or 16 times, which is totally acceptable if we expect rates to go down. So you want to move away from the trendiest markets right into the mid caps, into the small caps, into some of the foreign markets. And if you do that meaningfully, you know, for five or 10% of your portfolio, you'll get the benefit you know, of, of this sort of total re-rating of the market that we think will take place. But you don't want to time this uh, the situation and say, oh my goodness, it's all over now because we've had this movement in technology. The type of change we're talking about with artificial intelligence affects every industry and every company. And the adoption of it is something that we're going to be monitoring and looking for those companies that actually become more efficient, maintain their margins and drive revenues as a result of AI's you know, sort of Rapid acceptance. David Balin of City. David, thank you. On the economy, on financial markets, on the individuals in cash, not just year to date over the last six months, but potentially over the last decade, waiting for what Tom always talks about, that entry point, that elusive entry point. Really? TK, we talked about it a few times. You, you go into cash, that's decision one. The harder decision is decision two, which is when to get back out of cash, it's and wildly, it's always more difficult. We've been over it before. We don't have to beat it to death, but it's wildly, in my opinion, asymmetric, and that it's particularly easy to get out of the markets when you're in a profit mode, and there are a lot of people that were in that position. So you get out, you take a profit, uh, taxable or not, and you're in cash, and you're comfortable. And the phrase the pros use is setup. What is your mental and actual on paper setup to get a process to get back in the markets? Most don't have that. I love what he said about 6040 in response to your question, Tom, that he's back in love with it. And it seems as though that's what a lot of people are saying, maybe not right. out loud, but that's the quiet story underneath. 
saying diversification is the only free lunch on Wall Street. And that seems right. to be this feeling as people push into other areas, like we heard from Michael Shaul. And that's real quick and real simply here. You're 60, 40, and there's no respect for David Balin until you're down, what, John, 13.2%. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, how about that 60, 40? At 5% returns in cash felt good until the Nasdaq started to deliver yeah. 10%, well, it's 20, human condition. 30 40. Yeah. To your point, Thomas, the psychology of this moment I find most interesting. If you have sat this out, what do you do? Chase the gains in tech? Keep oh. setting it out? Uh. Look for gains elsewhere? Look for a market that broadens out? We've heard that from multiple people this morning. Luke Carr of UBS, looking for a market rally to broaden out. Michael Shaw of Market Field Asset Management, it's, looking for the rally to broaden it's out. It's so much like 1976 when Janet Yellen was five years out of Yale. I think she was, you know, at, at the hot dog place to Toasties at Harvard <laughs> Square. She was a research assistant at Harvard before she went out to Berkeley to, you know, be at the Haas School for a million years. Yeah, it I don't think she did hot dogs quite like you did hot dogs, no, TK, probably not. to be but, honest with you. Know, there she was teaching at Harvard. That conversation can commence right now. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern sitting down with the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. Anne-Marie, over to you. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, we're very pleased to be joined by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. You join us now from India, where you're meeting your counterparts. It's the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting. And really, the cloud around this meeting is the fresh data we got out of China today. Beijing slowing momentum in their growth. City is talking about uh, the growth target being at risk. I'd like to start, Treasury Secretary, with the fact of whether you think this means there could be an increased chance of a U.S. recession. Well, uh, you're talking about the slow growth number from China. Is that right, Anne-Marie? Yes, correct. Uh, so I think China has seen slower growth uh, than they expected um, upon opening up from COVID. Uh, consumer spending has been relatively weak. Um, it looks like consumers are more focused on building back their savings buffers. And so growth has been slow. And as you know, youth unemployment um, is quite high there. So I think the Chinese are concerned about uh, sluggish growth in their economy. But what does this mean for U.S. growth and global growth overall? Is the soft landing in the United States still your base case scenario? Well, many countries do depend on uh, strong Chinese growth uh, to promote growth in their own economies, particularly countries in Asia. And um, slow growth in China can have some negative spillovers. Uh, for the United States, uh, growth is slowed, but our labor market continues to be quite strong. Um, I don't expect a recession. I, I think that we're on a good path to bringing inflation down. The most recent inflation data were quite encouraging uh, that we're making progress on getting inflation down. But um, as I'd hoped and expected, that would occur in the context of a strong labor market, and we continue to see that. Uh, the labor market's been, the fact the labor market's been so strong has uh, encouraged more prime age people to enter the labor force and to work, and that's helped take a bit of the heat out of the labor market. Um, the fact that growth overall has slowed after we enjoyed a rapid recovery, that's normal, but it's also led to some reduction in um, the uh, d desire of firms to hire, still lots of job openings, but mm -hmm. uh, wage growth is moderating and inflation is uh, subsiding. So I think we're in a good path on the United States. Okay, so it sounds like soft landing is your base case and you don't think we're going to see a recession. Yesterday, when you were speaking to reporters, you talked about this de-escalation with China and you ruled out lifting tariffs as part of this de-escalation with Beijing. So what is on the table? So um, 
you know, several years have gone by in which we've had um, COVID lockdowns, especially in China, and very limited contact between senior officials in the United States and China. And um, we now have a new economic team in China uh, that uh, we need to establish relationships with. Uh, we need to get our relationship back in a more stable place, put a floor under it, and try to promote better understanding between our countries. So uh, I recently made a trip um, met with a number of senior uh, Chinese officials, including uh, the new economic team there. Uh, we had very candid discussions. Um, each side raised a series of concerns. Chinese uh, certainly mentioned their concern with the tariffs that we have in place. Um, but we had constructive conversations, uh, deepened our understanding, and um, of the economic situation and um, of our concerns, we're able to address them and agree that there are a broad range of global challenges, particularly debt and climate change that affect the entire global economy that we need to work on jointly. And um, I'm hopeful we'll able, be able to do that more successfully. On tariffs, um, you know, we put tariffs in place on China because we had um, underlying concerns about unfair uh, trade practices, particularly those affecting intellectual property and technology transfer. And those concerns really have not been addressed. Um, mm -hmm. We're undergoing a four-year required review of tariffs and, of course, China also retaliated, putting tariffs in place on us. Um, we have to see what comes out of the four-year review. But I would emphasize um, that really the underlying concerns we have have not yet been addressed, and we need to work on that going forward. But when you're looking at de-escalating, we're trying to figure out what will be left on the table, because what it feels right now is the administration is actually just amping up when it comes to potential tit for tat with Beijing. There is the outbound executive order that potentially we could see as soon as the end of July or this summer. Could that be a place pulling a punch from the outbound executive order, may, maybe making that a little bit more toned down? Could that be a place you could de-escalate with Beijing? Well, first of all, I want to say that what we're doing is not tit for tat. What we're doing is um, putting in place controls that are designed to protect U.S. national security and, in some cases, to address uh, fundamental human rights abuses. And um, we do intend to protect our national security we have export controls that play an important role in accomplishing that. And what I try to explain to our Chinese um, counterparts is that our desire is to, to make these uh, U.S. policies clearly national security focused, uh, transparent, and narrow. Um, that we're not attempting to stifle economic progress in China, that we have and want to continue to have uh, deep economic ties. After all, this year our trade has reached almost $700 billion. Um, we right, feel but if that, the national security uh, concerns. Healthy economic Madam Secretary, if the national security concerns are so important, Jake Sullivan called for this outbound executive order two years ago. Why is it taking the administration so long? So we are looking carefully at outbound investment controls, and they would serve as a complement to the export controls that we have in place um, to make sure that we have covered all the channels by which technologies can be transferred to China that we think pose national security concerns. I explained to my Chinese counterparts 
that if we go forward with these, they would indeed be narrowly targeted. They would focus on a few sectors, in particular semiconductors, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence, that they would contain a combination of notification requirements and in very narrowly scoped um, portions of these sectors, um, prohibitions. But these would not be broad controls that would affect U.S. investment broadly in China or, in my opinion, um, have a fundamental um, impact on affecting the, the investment climate for China. So these would it be national like security focused. It sounds like it's already done. Is the administration have it finished and is just waiting for a good time to release it? We want to make sure if we do this that we get it right. And we've been working on the details. Um, if we do go ahead, um, and there is a good chance that we will, that we would put out, you know, along with the executive order, a notice of proposed rulemaking so that the public would have a chance to comment on these um, proposed controls and um, we would receive a wide range of public input before finalizing anything that we do. M Madam Secretary, you obviously have a lot on your plate when it comes to re-engaging with China and your discussions there just off this trip from Beijing. I'm curious how difficult the dialogue is going to continue to be after the revelations about um, the Chinese hacking of your colleague, Secretary Gina Raimondo. So I do have concerns about um, hacking of U.S. government officials or uh, private individuals or companies, and I know the United States has expressed those concerns. But we intend to continue to deepen our discussions uh, with China uh, to increase our engagement. It, it's especially important to um, explain what our motivation uh, is to avoid misunderstandings that can lead to unnecessary and dangerous escalation. Uh, President Xi and President Biden agreed in Bali that um, senior, e senior officials, including those in economics, um, should interact more regularly. And um, I think an outcome of my trip there was that we will have deeper ongoing engagement at all levels. When did you learn about the China email hacking? I'm curious if you had a chance to maybe bring this up on your trip to Beijing. Um, I believe I did not know about that um, in Beijing. I, it was, wasn't one of the things that we discussed. I also want to ask about what's happening on the ground, something that I know is very important to you, and this comes to debt relief of these developing countries. Um, there has been this push from the U.S. administration to use the Zambia principle for other countries like Ghana, but that's not getting the broad support it needs in India on the ground amongst other G20 uh, finance ministers. Is China the holdup here? Well, look, we, we designed, the G20 designed um, something called the Common Framework, which is a set of <clears throat> principles and processes to deal with unsustainable debt situations. And um, we would like to see countries that apply to use the Common Framework get rapid relief from their debt um, that they need in order to grow and be able to attract investment and undertake um, IMF programs that can help to stabilize their economies. And the few cases that have um, applied to use the common framework, including Zambia, have taken far too long. The process has been onerous and it's taken a very long time to get debt relief. We are pleased that China has become, China after all is a major 
creditor of these countries. Um, we have been anxious to see China move more quickly and take a more constructive um, attitude of participating in these debt relief talks. And um, getting agreement on Zambia was an important step. China has also um, been helpful in Ghana, the case of Ghana and uh, Sri Lanka. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able, going forward, to make more rapid progress. I, I should emphasize that the debt issue is one that concerns the entire G20. And we are united in wanting to see this framework work more effectively. And uh, it is a priority for India as well. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for your time today, live from India at the G20 Finance Ministers and Central Bank Governors meeting. And safe travels to you, as I know you're heading off to Vietnam next. John, that was, of course, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Uh, main takeaway from me, obviously, is she's pretty much ruling out a U.S. recession. So it does seem like soft landing is her base case. But also, when it comes down to the escalation between China and the United States, she didn't want to get into what was actually the tools they can use on the tables. Tariffs at the moment still seem like something the U.S. administration won't touch. And when it comes from the outbound executive order, it sounds like it's almost done, and it does seem like it is very narrow in scope. And when she knew about that hacking as well. Great questioning there. Fantastic conversation, as always. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in conversation with U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. To MH's point, two themes there. One, China. One was about U.S. growth. Let's deal with China first. This from Janet Yellen moments ago. China hasn't addressed U.S. concerns that led to tariffs. Those tariffs, of course, from the previous administration still on China and being continued by this administration. Janet Yellen on the U.S. economy, Tom. We're on a good economic path in the United States. I don't expect a U.S. recession. The labor market is strong. On that second point, the labor market being strong, TK, that surprised so many people including, I would say, this Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell going back to Jackson Hole from last year, yeah. where unemployment was between 35 to 4%, and right now it's in and around 35 We should remind ourselves this is one of our experts. Whatever your politics on labor economics, Yellen is clearly codified with the word slack, and you wonder where the slack is when it's 2.x percent unemployment rate in Milwaukee. It's the oddest of times, and she is super, super wicked qualified to understand how fully employed the employable are in America. There's the political issue that the president faces of people who are less than employable. We'll play out some more of that conversation through the next <coughs> several hours on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. In about 45 minutes from now, I'll catch up with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie again, and we'll get some reaction to that conversation with Matt Miskin and Colin Martin from John Hancock and Schwab, respectively. And then around the opening bell, 60 minutes from now, Joanne Feeney at Advisors Capital on the equity market and the surprising performance from the airlines from the cruise line operators. Janet Yellen talked about the strength of the labour market. Can the discretionary spend boom in these parts of the economy, Tom, can it continue given the performance <clears throat> of those stocks so far this year? I think Bramo's qualified to answer this. I mean, you know, every weekend it's a different airport. But, 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 but the answer is, um, you know, I, don't, I think everyone is so dumbfounded by the new character of our travel I don't think anybody has an informed understanding of, say, autumn of 2025. I would agree. I also think people are looking out to October when the student loan repayments have to start going again for the first time in three years. Where does that money come out of at a time when these a lot of these uh, these creditors have not been paying down their debt? They've been incurring other debt. <laughs> and that's well, sort that's of what some of the studies are showing. Here. Let's go yeah. there right now. That's brilliantly said. Let's go there right now and advance forward from what we heard from the secretary. Greg Daco joins us, chief economist at EY Parthenon. And uh, we can do an audible here, Greg, with you. You're so competent on it, away from general economic chit chat, is the overlay of an indebted America. Let's begin with the consumer. How indebted does Ernst & Young see the American consumer? Well, I think, I mean, there's no doubt that we have seen uh, the level of debt rise uh, overall for U.S. consumers. But if you look at it from a historical perspective, uh, the amount of mortgage debt that consumers hold right now is historically still quite low at a 20, 25 year low. Uh, we have seen revolving debt come back quite aggressively. Um, and that is one pocket of concern, as Lisa was, was highlighting, with consumers having to now pay 
uh, their student loans once again, that will put tremendous pressure on those at the lower end of the income spectrum. And we know that that is already where we were starting to see some cracks in the foundation with a higher debt servicing ratio and also interest rates mm -hmm. on these credit cards that are rising to levels that are 20, 21, 22 percent. Very high for anyone to pay. And that's in a wheelhouse of study of EY. I mean, you know, this is one aspect of consumer analysis that you guys do. Lisa and I brought this up the other day. And that, I mean, come on, I'm speaking as a complete hack, both in religion and finance. It's biblical, these rates that we're being asked to pay on charge cards. Are they sustainable? I mean, do we get out to the new New Testament on what, what, what we're going to pay here? Well, I think what's important here to, to realize is that we are going to be in an environment where the cost of capital is going to be higher. It's not just for consumers. It's for businesses as well. Uh, we are seeing some gradual adaptation to this higher cost of capital, and we're hearing from a lot of clients that they're being much more careful with their investment decisions because in this higher rate of interest environment, you have to be careful that this, is, this project is still going to be profitable. And so that is the new reality that we're going to be in. It's still taking some time to filter through to every actor in the private sector, but once we get to more stability and more foresight as to where the Fed will end up in terms of its terminal rate, where interest rates, long-term interest rates will settle, then we'll have more clarity and likely a bit more of a tailwind in terms of business sector investment, perhaps even hiring. And I think that's where the hope really comes from. In this environment where supply is, there's not enough supply, where we're undersupplied, this potential boost from the supply side, once the private sector adapts to this higher cost of capital, could be a tailwind in this economy. That's where the hope of a soft landing comes from. So just taking a step back, is less consumer spending a positive, a necessary prescription to get the soft landing, to bring inflation lower, and to bring the economy into a more sustainable pace? Yeah, I mean, we've seen consumer spending slow. We've seen business investment slow. What we haven't seen is a type of retrenchment that we typically see ahead of a recession. And that's why you're seeing a lot of forecasters dial back their recession calls, because essentially, we haven't seen employment retrench. We haven't seen consumer spending retrench. We haven't seen manufacturing retrench. What we've seen is a slowdown in the pace of economic activity, still moving forward, but moving forward at a more cautious pace. And that may just be just enough to get us onto this trajectory back to a 2% target. That's what the Fed is hoping for. It's going to be very difficult for the Fed in this environment to calibrate monetary policy because we know there are still hawks yeah. that were disappointed not to have raised rates in June. We'll raise rates in July. The question is what happens later in the year in terms of further tightening. It does feel like every week we have a different narrative. And this week we're continuing with the soft landing or the no landing type of scenario. And we were speaking earlier with Michael Shaul uh, of Market Field Asset Management. And he was pointing to the manufacturing sector, saying he expects it actually to catch up with services, not necessarily the other way around. Uh, just moments ago, we did get the Empire manufacturing data for July. It was supposed to contract. It did not. It expanded by 1.1%. Are we seeing that kind of trend, that manufacturing has been in its slump and will recover and now catch up to the dynamism that we're seeing in the services area? Potentially. I mean, that's that's what can happen in an undersupplied world. Uh, we know, for instance, in the construction world, in manufacturing, there is this shortfall of supply. So we are seeing businesses invest in areas where there is a shortfall of supply. And that could be a very interesting economy going into 2024, where Actually, it's the supply side that drives momentum, and the Fed does not need to do too much on the demand side to cool demand too much because demand has already cooled. And as we get this rebalancing, that helps with inflationary pressures in terms of cost as well as in terms of wages because we're seeing supply on the labor front come back as well. That's the optimism that is there. We still have to note that there are risks, right? We have an environment where credit conditions have tightened. We were talking about leverage in some sectors of the economy. We have a global economy that is slowing. The numbers out of China weren't that good this morning. So we have an environment where the backdrop is soft. That's a risk in terms of, of U.S. activity. Greg, this headline out moments ago, and I don't want you to, you know, comment on it specifically. Bramo's got the F-150 Lightning in the third car, third door of the garage. Ford cuts F-150 Lightning prices, some by as much as near $10,000. Is this the disinflation and deflation up at the revenue line? Is this the price adjustment we're beginning to see? 
I think to some extent it is, right? We have seen that uh, both used prices, used car prices and new car prices surged uh, way beyond their pre-pandemic trends. Um, we're starting to see some correction on that front, both in terms of new <clears throat> and in terms of used car prices. That is the disinflationary win that we were talking about six months ago. The fact yeah. that once this inflation gets underway, it can actually surprise to the upside in terms of velocity. Greg Dacle, thank you so much. Greatly, greatly appreciated uh, this this morning here on the adjustments of the American economy. You know, Lisa, the, the toxic brew here, it, which is really interesting, is is at the revenue line, and I'm talking about a holistic, not microcosm, but a ginormous American revenue line. It's two separate parts, unit dynamics and price dynamics. Am I right that the F-150 is a successful product? I mean, I know you love it. And <laughs> Matt Miller bought one, and so you decided to get one, too. But we're not talking here about Tesla stress or, oh, there's too much ketchup on the shelves. I think we're talking about a successful product with a price cut. And we've seen this in other electric vehicles as well. And the key issue is, is this just they got too greedy and the margins were too big well, to begin yes. with? Or is this a lack of demand and something more insidious about consumer spending? People will try to say this is more about the, for, the, the, the former, not necessarily the latter, and that it's just simply that the yeah. margins were too wide. But to give you some color to this, Ford said it was cutting prices up to nearly 17 percent. The F uh, one. 50 Lightning Pro, the price cut is almost $10,000 to $49,995. The F-150 Lightning by about $6,000 oh, of a price cut, cut uh, to $91,995. $91, but is this to compete also with more traditional cars? Because yes. people couldn't spend what it well, costs a big debate. to buy an EV. And, you know, this is, goes back to uh, uh, Secretary Yellen and talking about China and geranium and gallium and other things. I don't understand. I love how our control room has that video of you driving <laughs> down. You know, you were up <laughs> yeah, near Tupper me. Lake somewhere. Mm. Uh, driving. For those of you on radio, it's Bramo in her F-150 Lightning. That would be very cool, actually, but unfortunately, I'm that's not me. I'm such a sucker for it. I, I agree I know, totally. I totally I am want such a sucker pick up for truck. it. I, I am so great. jealous of Matt. Matt Miller, what would you take out of Secretary Yellen? I take out of it, there's a lot of delicacies here, and there's what I took out of it is there's debates within Pennsylvania Avenue over how to proceed. And debates around the interconnectedness of the U.S. and China and how to break some of that delicately without causing an economic collapse in either country, right? Also... Yeah. The sense that there's a lot of lobbying from private companies to Janet Yellen, I'm guessing, quietly oh, saying, this is going to be tough for us to yeah. really get to uh, combative. Yields in, uh, down 2% on the two-year yield, down 2% on the 10-year yield. On the Standard & Poor's 500, down one-tenth of a percent. You know. I got to say, Tom, that to me, really, the theme of the week is going to be all of the data that we get, yes, but even more so, really, the earnings, in particular, what we see from this. some of the smaller banks, not just the big banks. How much do we get guidance that we really are going to see a rapid tightening in conditions that we haven't yet seen play out in the larger data? And the mystery here, this is sell four to keep you people interested in a summer Monday into Tuesday into Wednesday is, you know, everything said, the focus is on Goldman Sachs. We think Morgan Stanley's got to come out with an asset story somewhat akin to the joy we saw from J.P. Morgan. Uh, you know, and, you know, we'll see others and all that. But I, I think a lot of Wall Street's just there's a there's a curiosity to the state of Goldman Sachs. Especially considering all the news that we've heard and how much they've pulled down some of their expectations. If we do have all of the banks come out with the Jamie Dimon-like proclamations that consumers are still spending, that they're still seeing uh, a really robust economy. Recession nowhere in sight. We heard that from Wells Fargo as well. Where does that leave the market? Is that just sort well, of buy everything and the 60-40 is back in vogue? I'm not going to put that much weight on it. I'll just say Bank of America will, of course, capture a national retail spirit uh, as well. We'll have all that for you with uh, Shanali Basak here. Uh, coming up this uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. But I'm going to go beyond it to what we see with the rest of the earnings, which goes back to the Ford announcement, where all these people had the bloom of outstanding revenues. 6%, excuse me, 4% revenue growth suddenly became 8% at revenue growth. And the conference calls on that will be just absolutely fascinating. You've been great on that. And revenue growth mm. that might slow with slower inflation, yeah. that's kind of the interesting, uh, you know, conundrum. 
misery here on a Monday. A market's <laughs> red and green on the screen, uncertain. It's like the Yankees and the Red Sox tied for last place. Good morning. Growth is slowed, but our labor market continues to be quite strong. Um, I don't expect a recession. I, I think that we're on a good path to bringing inflation down. The most recent inflation data were quite encouraging uh, that we're making progress on getting inflation down. Yellen of Yale, a most original Secretary of Treasury. I really can't emphasize that enough. Really unique in the modern history of the office. I'm going to take it back to Andrew Mellon, which was a few years ago. At least it doesn't remember that, but I do, unfortunately, remember Andrew at Mellon. But that's a really original Secretary of Treasury, I would suggest. Everyone knows I'm a big fan of uh, Chairman Yellen, but uh, the bottom line is they're really forceful here on the state of the American economy. And the Biden administration, for whatever reason, and people can disagree, they stand tall on what their Fed, their institution is doing. Yeah, and they seem to uh, just let it run its course. The consistency that we've heard, <clears throat> soft landing, soft landing, and people used to shrug yeah. it off, and now they're saying, actually, yeah, it is, and everyone's agreeing. We're going to pause right now, and I'm going to suggest that this is the interview of the week for those that have read Fabozzi. What's really important here is to understand the financial media's focus on full faith and credit, on government paper. It's easy. People follow it. They look at the 10-year yield like they look at the Dow and on and on. There's a whole new world out there after all, and long ago and far away, uh, you know, I think she was, I don't know, political English economics major, whatever, Chicago. Pre-law. Owned the high ground. Owned the high ground. <laughs> she was pre-spread <laughs> at, at Chicago. She owned the high ground at the University of Chicago and brought it over to Bloomberg News to look at this curiosity known as the bond market. We're now going to talk about your absolute wheelhouse, which is the difference in yield between normal full faith and credit government where amateurs like me look and where you guys look, which is the yield on a piece of Procter & Gamble out seven years. Okay, this to me is the fascinating moment, right? It's sort of the equity-like asset in the credit market. How do you price out default risk? How do you price out economic slowdown? And the person to talk about it is not me. It is Brad Rogoff, who's head of uh, FIC Research over at Barclays. And he's joining us at a time where that equity-like premium is at its lowest level going back more than a year, even though we are seeing defaults pick back up, even though things are slowing, albeit perhaps not, you know, a crash and burn recession. How do you make sense of this? Well, everything's rallying across most markets. I think that's how you make sense of it, right? The high yield credit market, for example, which you're referencing, is is rallying just like everything else, and it's hard not for the rising tide to lift all ships. That being said, when you have high yield spreads, I'm sure you guys can pull up the Bloomberg index. You know, getting inside of 400, that that's well inside of average levels, and and it does feel probably tighter than you can justify if you kind of think about medium term fundamentals and everything going on in markets, and especially default rates, right? We still think this year in high yield, you'll probably see a 3 to 4% default rate. You'd expect a little extra premium as a result of that. Is, you know, is the mismatch you know, really large? No, but would we feel a lot better if it was 100 basis points wider? Yeah, we probably would. <laughs> Kelsey Barrow of J.P. Morgan Asset Management was on earlier, and I said, you know, if credit's a leading indicator, it's suggesting that there's not going to be a significant default cycle, and it suggests that the rally that we're seeing in equities is entirely justified. She said it's not a leading indicator. Is credit no longer the smart money? So, look, I, I think each cycle's different, and that's and that's what we're learning, right? And so credit was certainly the leading indicator if we go back to a period like 2008 and the financial crisis, but things are quite a bit different this time. And you know, think about the, the most recent episode we had around regional banks and the like. Well, what happened? We, we came up with some rules that worked really well versus the 2008 crisis when it was an asset quality problem. But what did you do to kind of deal with those rules if you're a bank? Well, you bought out the curve because the curve was upward sloping at the time. And so I, I do think you have to take a step back and say, OK, well, maybe this crisis isn't going to be like the next one if you're looking for for that next episode. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that the high yield market specifically has gotten a bit higher quality than it was historically because there have been alternative avenues of financing. And as a result, maybe that's not the exact place to look. 
I, I, I look at, and, and I want to make this fear that uh, clear folks of Brad Rogoff's royalty here popping from Lehman to Barclays, and we're trying to get them over to Bloomberg here as we move the indexes that we all follow over. You bring up the Lehman total return index, now the Bloomberg total corporate index as well, and it's basically a linear regression straight up, everything's wonderful, off a cliff, and then I'm going to call it a dead cat bounce. What are the ramifications if we do get price down, yield up in corporate paper. Yeah, and I think I think the reason we had that kind of fall off a cliff that you just alluded to, a lot of that is when you think about corporates in general, especially investment grade corporates, for example, the duration is significant and you know longer than actually the average duration, say, on, on treasuries, right? Um, and as a result, when you have a huge increase in interest rates, that you can have pretty bad total returns. Now, that doesn't mean actually the credit spread component is is problematic. And as Lisa was just alluding to, and, and Tom, you were originally, that's come in quite a bit. So I think what the ramifications are right here is that yields actually look pretty attractive on a lot of these assets. So you were talking about high yield. Well, the spread is well below average. And in fact, around 400 spread, if you look at returns going forward, it, it tends to be mediocre, honestly. Um, but if you look at eight to nine percent kind of yield, which is the range that we've been in for yield, those returns tend to look pretty good. So I think the one thing you have to factor in is because of the move, and, and Tom's alluding to it with those total returns, you've got margin for error right now in, in total returns in credit markets. I mean, I'm looking at price down. I'm like, I mentioned Procter and Gamble earlier, folks, was just because you know vet bill needs some you know. Procter & Gamble shampoo or something. That's why it was on my mind. But just take a given corporate. I don't, you know, it, it, we don't need to name uh, the name, but I'm sorry, with yields up, you've got price down in the corporate landscape. Is this a tendency here where you load the boat on size or are you more sophisticated about duration as you ladder into corporate bonds? Yeah, and, and I think what we're seeing right now in, in terms of corporates is really people are taking a comparison and saying, okay, you can get risk-free or, or, you know, essentially full faith and credit, um, as you mentioned, in the front end for a lot of yield. And so if you look at the shape of the curve, you have to want duration. You have to want that to not have the reinvestment risk and feel really comfortable if you're going to go out and buy longer dated credit. You said that you wouldn't necessarily look in credit for the risk signals, that you would look elsewhere. Where is the elsewhere? Is it the private markets that have really created almost a buffer for the public credit markets that used to be the frontier of a lot of this investing. Yeah. And so I, I think you do have more risk there. Now, do I think it's a systemic problem? No, I, I don't actually think the size of those markets are big enough to have any kind of systemic problem like we had in in uh, in 2008. I also don't think the leverage in the system there in terms of people using financial leverage to buy those assets is quite enough to have an unwind like we had in 2008. But if you look at the corporate leverage, right? Much more of that corporate leverage. Some of it went to the leverage loan market. A lot of it did go to the private credit markets. And, you know, while, while there's some opacity around that, you can look at things like BDCs and you can see a lot of the leverage there. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a little bit more Excuse risk me, there. What's a BDC? Business Development Corporation. <laughs> Sorry, I should have mentioned it's that one. It's a closed end fund of sorts with Keep certain tax benefits. There's a, just a, I check the Red Sox. <laughs> so I was looking at Lisa when I said that. <laughs> no. Sorry. You one, were looking at me one, when you said that. <laughs> one final question as we game out what's to happen. And Tom asked this earlier. It was a great question. How many equity investors are parlaying into your space in a very new way because of the yield? You know, there were a lot, actually. If I look back to kind of the second part of last year, the credit markets were under some pressure. I'm sure you guys discussed plenty, and I think I did maybe even one time I was on, about some of these leveraged buyouts that got hung at the banks, and, and we saw a lot of that. Right now, the spread is starting to scare them a little bit. And as we get into, like, eight-handle yield and not a ton of spread and high yield, we're seeing a little bit less there. Are you, there's 8% yields out there and something I can tolerate? Uh, maybe sevens for you, Tom. <laughs> you, get a, you get a haircut. Double Bs, we'll give them. I remember full faith and credit, at, you know, pre-Voker or middle of Voker, like I'll say 11% full faith and credit. Yeah, it was but nuts. If, if you think about it, so right now the average yield on high yield bonds is 8.3%, even with that really narrow spread. So just to give you what, a sense, that's the average. What do you say at the, with the quickly here to the youngsters at Barclays that have never known a normal yield market? 
Yeah, it's actually a great point, right? Because someone who wasn't there before 2008, it's a very different conversation. So a lot of the conversation that we're having, I had a big investor event last week, and the conversation was when you look at high yield, for example, we'll stick with that. Do you look at price or do you look at yield? That's beautiful. Well, I'm going to steal that from you. That's my theme for this week. Coming up, uh, we're going to look at price and we're going to look at yield. Always (laughs) on Bloomberg Surveillance. (laughs) We'll steal from Barclays anytime we can, Bradley. Thank you uh, so much. Please continue with us. Important bank earnings tomorrow. We'll have complete coverage. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning. 